Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, the um, budget meeting of um, Mid-Suffolk District Councillor. I'm Councillor James Caston, Chair of the Council. Um, but before this meeting commences, I'd just like to ask everyone to stand, if they can, in um, solidarity to the Ukraine, because tomorrow is a year since the Russian invasion. Um, so if, I, if people would like to just stand for a minute in solidarity, thank you. Um, may I first remind you? So, may I first remind you of some domestic arrangements? The toilets are situated outside the meeting room, opposite the stairs. Cold water is also available in the breakout area outside the meeting room. If the fire alarm should sound, please leave the meeting room by following the fire exit signs and meet on the Ipswich Town Football Club training pitch. Do not re-enter the building until you are told it is safe to do so. Please switch off all mobile phones and turn laptops to silent. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. The whole of this meeting will be filmed, except where there are confidential or exempt items. If you make a representation to the meeting, you will be deemed by the council to have consented to being filmed. By entering the meeting, you are also consenting to being filmed by the Council and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. The Council, members of the public and the press may record, film, photograph and broadcast this meeting when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded. And I'll move to the agenda. Item one is apologies for absence. Thank you, Chair. I have received apologies for absence from Councillor Guthrie and Councillor Eburn. Thank you very much. Declarations of interest by councillors. So, in accordance with delegated authority, the monitoring officer has granted dispensations to all members in respect to the 23-24 budget papers. Are there any other declarations of interest? Count Councillor Mansell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'd like to just declare that I am the uh, event director for the Park Run, which goes on at Chilton Fields, uh, which is related to uh, the Shelf Project. Uh, I've had a conversation with um, Jan Robinson, um, who says that I am able to uh, participate. Thank you very much. Councillor Pratt, was that a um, declaration? Yeah, um yeah, I'd just like to declare a non-pecuniary interest as a school teacher at Stowmarket High School. Okay, thank you very much. Any others? Councillor Carter. Just declaring a non-pecuniary interest as a uh, well, my daughter goes to Woodley, uh, which is a part of the shelf project. Okay, thank you very much. Is that all of them? Thank you. So um, we'll now move on to item three which is MC 2233, to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 26th of January 2023 for accuracy only. Are there any issues with accuracy? Councillor Stringer. Yep, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I was at that meeting, as many of us were. I, I don't believe it started at 5.30 p.m. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you, we'll take that on board. Um, 
<laughs> Councillor Epignon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On page seven, uh, the last sentence it says, are only mandatory if they effect. I believe it should be affect. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, with, with those um, changes, um, could I have a proposal for the minutes, please? Councillor Haddenham and a seconder. Councillor Epignon. Oh, could, we'll, we'll take this by hands and could all in favour please place, put their hands up. So that's pretty much unanimous. That's unanimous. Thank you. So it's carried. So um, item four is um, Chairman's announcements. I refer you to the paper MC 2234 for noting. Um, thank you very much and um, thank you everyone that's um, bought a ticket for my um, dinner night in the officers' mess on the 4th of March. And um, I hope you enjoy yourself and we raise plenty of money for the charity. So, um, thank you. Item five, leaders' announcements. I'd like to invite Councillor Morley to present her update. Thank you, Chair. Tomorrow, Friday the 24th of February, marks the one-year anniversary of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Since the war began, thousands of Ukrainians have been killed defending their freedom from Russia's appalling onslaught. Millions more have been forced from their homes, with many finding refuge in the UK under the Homes for Ukraine scheme, including nearly 350 here in Mid Suffolk. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, there will be a national moment of silence, offering people the chance to pay tribute to the courage of the Ukrainian people and to demonstrate the UK's unwavering solidarity with the country. I'm sure I speak for all of us at Mid Suffolk District Council when I say we continue to stand with Ukraine. I'm pleased to say Suffolk's district and borough councils, including Mid Suffolk, have secured £2.2 .2 million pounds worth of government funding to improve the standard of private rental homes in the county. This will tackle poor housing conditions and improve tenants' well-being. The funding from DLUC will be used to create and support additional roles, offering advice to tenants and landlords, and take enforcement action against those who let poor quality housing. It will also enable the councils to continue working collaboratively, pooling resources to improve the standards of privately rented homes. Suffolk's Public Sector Leaders Group agreed last week to fund a plan which aims to end rust sleeping in our county by 2027. During the pandemic, 160 people sleeping on the streets were accommodated in Suffolk in six weeks, including 42 in just one day under the Everyone In initiative. We have wanted to build on that work in Suffolk and provide a sustainable solution to the problem and help more people through a preventative approach. £175,000 has been agreed to develop, the plan, to develop the plans, which include more support for young people leaving local authority care who are at greater risk of homelessness. And in another great example of the collaborative approach we take in Suffolk, public sector leaders also agreed to fund a new supported food network. It will work with new and existing food outlets, including food banks, providing more stock and ensuring a range of enhanced support is available to meet local needs. It will also focus on early help and prevention, upskilling and additional support around benefits. SPSL agreed £1.5 million funding over three years for this project, led by the Collaborative Communities Board, and I'm sure this will build on the outstanding work of food banks, community larders and other charities helping more people in the cost of living crisis. SBSL had previously pledged £1.8 million to the Local Welfare Assistance Scheme, which saw more than 7,000 applications for help between October and December last year. SBSL has also published a report highlighting some of our key achievements in the last two, two, year, 
sorry, in the last two-year term. And these include committing 1.3 million to tackle gangs, county lines and trafficking, pledging more than 2 million championing Suffolk as a place to do business and supporting town centres, and investing £756,000 on work to improve the energy efficiency of Suffolk homes, and £1.5 million to support Suffolk's ambition to be net zero by 2030. I'm delighted to say our council has been shortlisted for five <coughs> national awards. Our Ga Gateway 14 project, which will bring thousands of jobs to the area, is a well-deserving finalist in the Asset Management and Regeneration category in the IEZ Public Sector Transformation Awards for 2023. Our tree canopy survey and tree planting strategy has been shortlisted in the Local Government Chronicle Awards in the Technology category and the IEZ Awards in the Green Public Service category. We've also been shortlisted for the National 2023 Smarter Working Live Awards which celebrate public sector excellence for our commitment to staff well-being. The council has been recognised in the putting people first category. And our local land charges department has been shortlisted in the 2023 Land Data Local Land Charges Award. It is fantastic to see our council being recognised like this and I'd like to congratulate everyone involved for all of these achievements. I've mentioned a couple of points about how we work with Suffolk public sector leaders, but I think it's worth just running through a few extra, extra points. So last Friday we held the last SPSL public meeting before the elections in May. So I think this is an opportune moment to update you on what we have been doing. So we've agreed important financial support for the Collaborative Communities Board, and the Housing Board, and I'm just going to whiz down a few statistics. 2.35 million to support business and the county's post-COVID recovery programme, of which 1.4 million has been put into the Suffolk Inclusive Growth Investment Fund, which has supported several projects, including Virtual High Street, Innovate Local and Innovation Labs. 1.35 million to tackle county lines and criminal exploitation, 1.5 million to deliver the Suffolk Climate Emergency Plan, 756,000 to improve the energy efficiency of homes, an additional 80,000 for Screen Suffolk following the setup support in 2016, half a million for the County Council's Get Suffolk Reading initiative, half a million for the Collaborative Communities Board and 400,000 for Suffolk Family Focus for preventative work to support vulnerable people. 200,000 for the Integrated Care Academy to support young people and their mental health, and one million for the Local Welfare Assistance Scheme to support residents facing financial hardship. Also, one million earmarked for Hawley Junction, one million earmarked for the Housing Board, and 375,000 earmarked for the Roars project. So that's just a few of the things that we've been getting up to over the last couple of years. Um, there is a end of term report that's available on the County Council website and I'll include a link to that in my report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Morley. Are there any questions for clarification? No? Okay, so we'll, um, we'll move on to item six. To receive notifications of petitions in accordance with the Councillor procedure rules. Thank you, Chair. None received. Item 7. Questions by the public in accordance with the Council procedure rules. None received. Item 8. Questions by councillors in accordance with the Council procedure rules. None received. Thank you. So we'll um, move on to item 9, which is MC 2235, which is General Fund Budget 2023 to 24 and the four year outlook. I refer you now to the amendment in the table papers received from the Green and Liberal Democrat group. As the budget reports are complex items, I am minded to allow the proposer of the report, um, uh, sorry, of the amendment, 10 minutes to introduce their item. 
please note that the deadline for submitting amendments to the budget papers has passed and there can be no further amendments submitted this evening. But first, I would like to invite Councillor Whitehead to introduce paper MC2235 and to move the recommendations in the report. Councillor Whitehead. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to introduce the General Fund Budget 23-24 and four-year outlook. So when the annual budget comes before full council, it's already been to cabinet briefings, to various political group briefings, to an all-member briefing. Twice it's come before review and scrutiny. In the penultimate stage, it comes before cabinet for endorsement to full council. So with this in mind, I will dwell just on a few key points while being happy to, happy to answer any members' questions before we move on to debate the budget. So as we approach the end of this current administration, the 23-24 budget and four-year outlook covers a whole period, bar a month and a few days, of the next administration. It therefore seems logical to me to say that this forward-looking report sets out this cabinet's financial legacy to the next administration. A crucial set of data that I consider to be vital when we're considering and appraising the 23-24 budget is the forecast in the four-year outlook, our medium-term projections. Because any decision we make for 23-24 must be based on long-term sustainability of the council's finances. So any proposal to freeze our council tax precept must only be evaluated and taken in the context of our medium-term projections. And we can see that these projections set out in Table 8, and all the various assumptions built into projections are set out in paragraphs 4.41 to 4.49. Now, over that four-year period, we are forecasting a cumulative surplus of 8 million. And these projections assume no replacement for new homes bonus before beyond 24-25, despite new homes bonus being crucial income for most other borough councils and district councils. So there will surely be something to all councils from government to take its place. The projections also assume no further growth in business rates, despite the significant growth that will inevitably come from the Gateway 14, as well as elsewhere within the district. The projections also assume no further increase in fees and charges beyond this current year. So with the council tax for 23 and 24, and quite possibly beyond, based on these projections, we can objectively demonstrate that our medium-term finances are abundantly secure and robust. This is our administration's financial legacy. We're currently in inflationary times, but hopefully we're now moving beyond its eye-watering short-term peaks. And the latest forecast from Citigroup this year, this week, is that inflation should get back to be 22% target levels or below, earlier than the Bank of England forecast. Looking back over the seven-year time frame that I've held this cabinet post and presented seven budgets to full council, retail prices in that period have risen by nearly 35%. Our mid suffolk precept, in contrast, has risen by less than 8%. I inherited a band D precept of £159.37, and seven years later, it's £171.59. It's increased by less than 8% over a full seven years. Had it increased by retail price inflation, it would have been over 215 pound. So mid suffolk Conservatives have been doing our bit for our residents' cost of living since 2016. I must also mention our reserve position and some proposed changes to them going forward. When the council commenced the development of Gateway 14, it did so by lending money to Gateway 14 Limited, the wholly owned subsidiary set up to deliver this ambitious project. The sale of a large tract of land to the range in December 22 has now de-risked the project. The interest accruing on the loan has now all been paid, and so the large commercial development risk management reserve that we established can now be repurposed. We are proposing, <laughs> proposing to combine that with our growth and efficiency reserve and part of the anticipated 2022-23 surplus into one, it's like having a cuckoo clock, into one... Um, um, into one large new strategic transformation in infrastructure fund. That fund should grow to be in excess of 9 million in the new financial year. 
a legacy with which to fund future investment in transformation and infrastructure. We're also going to set up a new community development fund reserve of half a million pound to support local communities and organisations with the delivery of local place-based initiatives and activities. Well, the full extent of our reserves is set out on table 5 under paragraph 440. Finally, our capital programme forms a vital part of our ongoing investment in the future for our council. And to our anticipated carry forward from 22-23 of 19.229 million, we are proposing to add a further 7.188 million in 23-24. And all the details of this, plus the three-year capital projections, are set out by project and by service area in Appendix A. Well, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions on the report presented today, but I may call on members of the finance team here to help with any questions on any granular detail. I'd like to pay tribute to our finance team. This is Melissa's first budget as the Section 151 officer, and I applaud the way she has transitioned into that senior role. And she's been ably assisted by Rebecca Hewitt, who sadly is leaving us shortly. I also want to publicly acknowledge the hard graft of Sharon Bayliss, who was generously loaned back into finance to do a sterling job in the budget preparation process. And that's just three names from within a large and much appreciated finance team but I say thank you to all involved. So, Mr Chairman, I'd like to move the recommendations 3.1 and 3.2 in the report that the general fund budget proposal to 23-24 and the four-year outlook be approved and that next year's general fund budget be based on no increase to the present Bandy council tax of £171.59. And that, of course, is a banding from which all other domestic dwellings from Band A to Band H are calculated. Mr Chairman, I commend this budget to full council. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we, we had a bit of a disturbance during that, which would normally end in a fine. But because the councillor in question made a very generous donation to my <laughs> charity just before this meeting, I, I, I won't fine her or name her at this point. So um, we'll move on, but everyone be warned. Could I have a um, seconder, please? Councillor Morley. Right, so now, um, oh, sorry, Councillor Morley. Yeah, I'm happy to second that, Councillor, thank you. So um, now we'll um, deal with this amendment that's come in. So I'd like to invite Councillor Mallon to propose the amendment for the Green and Liberal Democrat group. Um, thank you. Mr Chairman, members, um, in proposing this amendment, let me first take you back to happier days three years ago. Early 2020, uh, many of us still felt like new councillors. Uh, we were still finding our way. And this is before the pan pandemic. COVID-19 was still something far away in Wuhan rather than the massive threat it became. And whilst Ukraine was at war with separatists in the East, they had not been yet fully invaded by Russia. And of course, Theresa May was Prime Minister. So these were simpler times, perhaps happier times for some. But not for everyone. For many people in Mid Suffolk, there were already struggles with the cost of living and heating their homes. According to figures from the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, in 2017, there were 43,000 odd homes in fuel poverty. Uh, and out of the districts and boroughs in Suffolk, our district, Mid Suffolk, had the highest proportion of these, 10.2% of households. And the situation here, well not here, but Mid-Suffolk over there, is exacerbated by the fact that 53%, over half the homes in the district, are not connected to the gas grid and so are dependent on other, often more expensive ways to keep warm. Now fast forward to now, and as we all know, the global situation has changed radically. We've had the pandemic and we're still recovering from that. We've had Putin's appalling illegal invasion of Ukraine and all the horrendous consequences that have followed from it. Huge rises in the price of food and fuel and the cataclysmic effects on many household finances. And we've also had Brexit. And whether you were for or against that decision, it's had some effect. And we've had a certain amount of political turmoil here in the UK, which I won't go into since I don't want to bring back painful memories from my colleagues opposite. Also, perhaps dwarfing all these other immediate issues, we have the looming problem of climate change. 
And even at this early stage, we're seeing alarming effects, record temperatures around the world, including here in Suffolk, droughts and wildfires, and the emergence of a disturbingly unstable climate, just as our scientists have predicted. And it's perhaps inevitable that those figures for fuel poverty have got worse in the last couple of years because of the factors I've mentioned. The most recent figures show that 28% of households in Suffolk, that's around 95,000 homes, are now in fuel poverty. And whilst the government has provided generous support over the last few months, that support is coming to an end, and Ofgem are also likely to increase the price cap for energy again at the end of March. Now, amazingly, there are measures we can take which can help with all these different things. They can help with the energy crisis, the cost of living crisis, and also address our climate ambitions. I'm talking, of course, about energy saving measures, home insulation, energy conservation, reducing the amount of of energy that a home requires through efficiencies. This means lower cost, it means warmer homes, and it means lower emissions. There are multiple benefits. So this is why I'm putting forward our amendment to the budget today. We are proposing that the council puts aside two million pounds, representing about 10% of our reserves, in order to tackle the cost of living crisis, the energy crisis, and the climate crisis. If we can agree the principle of this funding today, with our excellent officers looking for ways to deliver it, targeted at the most in need, then families across the district could be enjoying the benefits as soon as next winter. Now, it would be wrong for me to stand here this evening and say that there is nothing currently happening in this area of work, because clearly there is. We have the Warm Homes Suffolk programme doing exactly this sort of thing, but currently on a limited scale. We also have the legacy programmes, the Warmer Homes Healthy People Initiative, still providing, providing advice and help. And the SPSL has recently agreed to fund the Fuel Poverty Retrofit Team, which will provide staff to support all this work. So we are not proposing a wholly new programme which needs to be designed. It could well be that the funding we set aside today could be used to support and expand these existing programmes. Current funding has been a little bit hit and miss. As with so much of government funding, we have to bid competitively when funding pots become available. Um, so whilst councils in Suffolk have been successful, it's not the comprehensive long-term funding that this area of work desperately needs. So to summarise, we propose that two million is set aside from reserves to tackle these interconnected crises. crises. Is this proposal affordable? Yes, it is. We are over 22 million in reserve, so this is less than 10% of that total. Is it legal? Yes, we have the section 151 officers agreement that this will not un unbalance the budget. Is it needed? I mentioned earlier that the latest figures show uh, the number of households in Suffolk in fuel poverty. The Warm Homes Programme currently targets around 250 homes per year, but aims to rise to 500, 750, and eventually 1,500 homes per year. Even at that rate, it would still take 60 years, 62 years to retrofit all of those homes in fuel poverty. So there's plenty of room, plenty of scope to expand what is already being done. Uh, lastly, is this amendment appropriate? To me, the last year has seen the coming together of various factors to give the modern world a severe shock, and people are suffering the consequences of that shock. This council is sitting on resources that can make a difference. Not just bailing people out for now, but making a long-term difference. Now we know that two million will not retrofit all of Mid Suffolk, but targeted at, mo at those most in need, it would help. So I encourage you to support this amendment. I was looking forward to Councillor Eburn uh, seconding it. Seconding it. Uh, unfortunately, she's not able to be here, but I understand there's gonna be a seconder from uh, the administration. Uh, Rachel, if you're listening, I wish you well. I hope you soon feel better. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd like to echo those words to um, Councillor Eburn. Um, so, um, can I have a seconder, please? Uh, thank, you, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I'm, I'm happy to second this, this motion. Um, I mean, Two million pounds isn't a trivial sum. You know, it's not like trying to find a needle in a haystack or one green MP in a full parliament. 
but at the same time, <laughs> at, the, at the same time, you know, looking at it in terms of, of total reserves, um, two million pound is is relatively is a relatively small sum, and I think um, the uh, so Councillor Mellon has put a, a good case forward to take this a, as an addition to our to our budget, and on that basis, I'm happy to accept it. Thank you very much, um, Councillor White. Whitehead, so you've accepted the amendment. So I'll go to Councillor Morley, the seconder. Um, do you accept the amendment? Yes, Chair, I do. Thank you very much. So we'll um, now go to um, that now becomes a substantive motion, and we'll go to questions. And um, I'll ask um, uh, councillors to um, speak as many times as they like, um, but please keep it to the subject matter. Um, under discussion. Um, so, um, who would like to start with questions? Councillor Passmore. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. One of the points about any scheme like this is how will you decide or who will decide who is targeted and who isn't? Because one of the potential challenges, those that are just over the line that get nothing, I just wondered if anybody had got any thoughts or whether that needs to be considered and we come back via email after it. But I do think that's important. So, how would it be targeted and who would be eligible and so on, please. Does anybody want to take that um, question or should we um, go into it later in email? Um, Councillor Matheson, do you want to take the question? Yeah, I, I just or do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, so, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah um, Councillor I, Matheson. I feel that the... Um, the question of eligibility is, is already being dealt with on, uh, under the Warmer Homes scheme, and so that should be all right. So that's how it's going to be done, is it? Do we know? Yeah, so that will be a cabinet decision, so um, that will be forthcoming, uh, I hope. Um, so um, now we've got Councillor Fleming. <coughs> Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, I'm also, I think, in principle, happy to support this amendment because I feel that um, not to support it actually would probably run against some of the things we already wish to do and um, that are already in our budget. But I do have a question, and that is, is there anything in this amendment that would or could um, upset the budget that was originally proposed that could alter it? Should we go to Councillor Whitehead with that, or would you like to... Um... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm happy to take our Section 151 officer's opinion on this, but from my point of view, I've got no concerns. So, um, would you like to comment? Just to agree, as already said, I've got no concerns either. I'm in support of this. Thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, just to make things clear, we're, um, this is now the substantive motion and we're, we're questioning the whole budget, not just the amendment. So um, it's now the, now, now the, the um, budget does include that amendment and the questions will be on that. But if you want to ask questions on the amendment, you can. Councillor Scarf. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, mine is specifically um, on the reserve situation. Um, we're creating this new strategic transformation and infrastructure fund, which actually I personally welcome uh, to fund future council projects. But in doing so, um, we are transferring what's left of the growth and efficiency uh, fund reserve as it, as it was. Um, I asked the question at scrutiny, and I was given the answer by Councillor Whitehead at scrutiny that it was the full intention that the authority continued to fund the councillor's locality allowance scheme. Um, now, this was originally funded from the Growth and Efficiency Fund, and obviously if it's merged into a new fund, uh, I welcome that confirmation that it will continue, and indeed I think scrutiny actually recommended that there was an, an increase, which has yet to be determined. Um, but I do think that rather puts us at odds with the position in Statement 4. I must push you for a question. Well, the question, and the question I'm quite happy is, to question, come to you in debate. Is, the question is, it puts us in, in, in contravention of 4.32, which says that reserves only provide one-off funding. 
And I do have a problem with that because I think it should be a line in the budget that says locality budget X, whatever we decide on. So why is it not in the budget? Because if we're not supposed to use reserves for that purpose, then why is it not in the budget as a line in the budget? And that's the question. Councillor Whitehead. I'm not sure I can give you a specific answer as to why it's not a line item, but I can assure you that um, the councillor locality grants, which are £7,350 for each councillor, which is 249900 in total, is, is in there for next year. We've also, rather than increasing that per capita figure, we've also put this 500,000 community uh, development fund aside for, for local projects which is basically, so effectively, from a locality's point of view, we've trebled the amount that's there for next year. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Field. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just really that the uh, fairly basic one, I guess, but the, the, the budget or the, the, the preamble to your papers talks very much about uh, the second quarter uh, outturns. We know certainly in this council we, uh, we get some dramatic changes, usually in, in around quarter four, where we realise how pessimistic we've been about um, income and uh, and uh, how we've overestimated expenditure. So really the question is, since um, quarter three is now gone, in fact it's, it's uh, six weeks ago that I think we passed that milestone, I was just... Uh, asking for your reassurance that there's nothing in here that has changed significantly you know we haven't finished up with a, a vast overspend or shed loads of spare cash as we, as we often do um, really are those figures that are based on quite ancient history still accurate thank you, you. councillor whitehead i've only seen very preliminary quarter three numbers because at that stage they were going to the senior leadership team but nothing i saw in there but you know scared me or anything uh, and I think there's no surprise main main surprises either positive or negative but again perhaps uh, I've been concentrating much on the budget so again if uh, Melissa could just perhaps elucidate as to what her thoughts are on quarter three it would might be helpful thank you director corporate resources thank you chair um, yeah I'm happy to confirm that actually it's in line with quarter two there's very little movement from quarter two to quarter three so no surprises at the moment I'm pleased to say Councillor Stringer. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, a couple of points, then I'll ask a, a, a question. Uh, can, can um, uh, I will intervene there and I'll say that this, this is a question, no, this session, is a question. This is and a question. such a blatant disregard for it. I would say blatant, I would say uh, good humour. It needs to be I answered. Uh, but anyway, okay, I'll just ask the question. Uh, in, in your introduction, Councillor Whitehead, you mentioned that business rate income will rise when, uh, as Gateway 14 fills up with businesses and stuff. It, it's my understanding that Gateway 14 is part of a free port and doesn't pay business rates. So if that is the case, where will that business rate income come from? Councillor Whitehead. So, so my understanding is that although the businesses themselves won't pay business rates, the equivalent figures, fig amounts, will come from central government, then it's a very complex way that it's allocated into pots A, B, or B1 and B2 and C or whatever. Um, but basically, we're certainly we're no worse off as a council, probably better off with this three pot status than if we were with identical, identical businesses being on that site as non three pot people. Thank you very much, and I feel that Oh, Councillor Passmore. Sorry, just one other thing, just for clarification, if I may. There's been a, some reports uh, in the media recently, I think this week, regarding local authorities, particularly districts and boroughs, and the provision of leisure facilities. The question I was just going to ask, and I'm sure the answer is yes, but confirmation, and I know we can't hold future administrations um, um, binding and so on, but there will be sufficient robustness in the uh, budget that we have and reserves and so on to make sure that our important leisure facilities at Stradbrook and Stowe Market um, will be maintained because they do actually help for the fabric of uh, Mid Suffolk. I think that's very important. So just a quick answer will be plenty. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Passmore. Councillor Whitehead. Yes, I have nothing to indicate otherwise. Thank you very much. And that will be the end of the questions. Thank you very much. We'll move on to... Um, 
debate and councillors will be um, allowed to speak once for three minutes and um, this will be timed. So does anybody want to start off debate? Councillor Flatman. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, we understand and appreciate the challenges for our leisure centres, providers, Stradbrook and Laxfield at this time, especially the combination of building back after COVID-19 and the unprecedented increase in utility costs. We have already supported them by installing a series of solar related investments to reduce the costs of their electricity requirements, include a solar pa including solar panels and the most recent investments of solar carports, with, which are a pilot. We will understand how well they are working after their first full year of operation. In the meantime, we know our provider is doing what they can to reduce their consumption and limit the impact of the increases and we are working closely with them to identify what we can do to support them and hope this is useful along with everything else we're doing with them. So, and I think I have a meeting with them next week. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we, keep a, we keep up to date all the time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flatman. Um, I can't see any more hands for... Oh, Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Chair. I, I, it's um, a, a rel relatively um, minor point, really, but I, I would like to see that some of the £2 million that we've, we've just um, put into the budget is actually used for training, in particular, of retrofit um, work, because at the moment the, um, the building industry uh, is shedding, is shedding labour, and, and already we, we see on our televisions and, and our neighbours um, people who, who have not got work at the moment. Now, these are the very people that would have the skills or could have the skills and the, got the background to, to actually do the retrofit work. So I, I would like to think that we would work together with the other councils in Suffolk and, and um, the relevant educational th um, education institutions to, um, to actually really boost that, that aspect up um, because it, it is a particular skill set and we are going to need it um, and we need to do it a lot quicker than the 60 years that um, Councillor Mellon suggested um, were, were a possibility unless we scale things up a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matheson. And we'll now have Council Councillor Stringer and following him, Councillor Davies. Thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry to prolong this. I could have done it once. Uh, I'll be supporting this budget, now amended budget, thank you, and thank you for accepting the amendment. Uh, the existing, we've been deliberately non-prescriptive in how this is done, because even the current frameworks that exist are not perfect. Uh, there's a number of people that wanted to be involved in the current frameworks, and because the energy efficiency uplift was what, what was not perfectly one scale point, they, they didn't qualify but they did qualify on a financial footing, so we couldn't help them the amount we could help them because it wasn't one scale point on, on the improvement to the building. So I think we, if we look at the current framework to see where people are falling through the net, that would be a really good use of some of this money, uh, uh, as well as other areas where we desperately need to get our housing stock, uh, as in Mid Suffolk PLC, uh, improved. Uh, I would also like to, uh, there, was, there was a question, I'd probably like to answer it. Uh, it was asked whether this would create uh, an upset in the uh, existing budget. I, I'm simple, so I looked up what upset means. It means an unexpected result or situation. If by unexpected result, it means we actually for once spend the budget that we are allocating today, I would welcome such an upset. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Davies. Ah, that's the right one. Thank you. I too will be supporting this motion. Um, if I read the documents correctly, when it comes to our employees, we're 
I think, proposing a 2% increase in their salaries. Clearly, it's not the forum to discuss the details, but I'd just like to air the view that possibly we might improve our retention of uh, our staff if we increased the lower paid ones more, thereby helping them in these difficult times. So that was my thought for the day. Yeah, can I go to the Chief Executive? Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor. And I wouldn't disagree with the principle that you put forward. I just wanted to provide a bit of clarity. So what's being proposed within the budget is 4% for next year in relation to staff and then 2% each year thereafter. Um, but as councillors will be aware, that sum, whatever that sum ends up being, is not actually within our gift anyway. It's something that's negotiated nationally uh, on our behalf. As it happens, we have today uh, seen the uh, sums come in in terms of what's being proposed by the employers uh, to put to the unions. Uh, it's complicated. I'm happy to share it outside the meeting rather than trying to go through it. I literally was just reading it as you asked the question. Um, but it comes in below that 4% level. Uh, so in terms of the budget assumptions, we would be uh, within that amount of money, assuming that that's the final agreed amount. And of course, it's, it's early days in any negotiation. Uh, but just wants to provide that clarity in terms of uh, how that may play through and what's proposed within the budget. Thank you very much. Um, any further contributions for debate? Councillor Field. Oh, thank you. See if I can read this after my uh, recent uh, attention to my eyes. Um, I just wanted to say something about the uh, the, the amendment, really. Um, it, the issue was that uh, if we're really serious about helping the most vulnerable in society, about tackling fuel poverty, um, and about showing all the rest of us what we need to, need to do to meet the challenges of climate change, then we need to up our gra game dramatically. Although, as Councillor Mellon has been saying, we, we are indeed doing things now, but not nearly as much as is, is necessary. Um, and we here on this side of the chamber have certainly argued many times that we should do that. Um, I think it's quite clear that some changes that we're talking about to, to, to lower bills, to make healthier buildings, some of them are, are quite easy to do. Um, you, you can add roof insulation to a house, for instance. Others are costly, things like swapping out triple gla double glazing for triple glazing. They're quite easy to do, but expensive. Some are valuable and necessary, but costly and quite difficult. Things like cladding walls are something that it's quite easy if to all get wrong. I think there's a tower somewhere in London that suffered that sort of problem. Um, and I think to get this underway, people need motivation to tackle the task, help and guidance with the choices they may need to, to make, and many may need help with the cost. But if we can up, kick this upgrade process into action, then still skilled installers will become available and costs will reduce. So uh, for those reasons, I personally wholeheartedly support this amendment and, and uh, obviously support the budget itself as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Field. Councillor Passmore. Yeah, right, third time lucky. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I'm very happy to support the... Um, um, the uh, amendment uh, along with the, uh, the uh, original motion. I just want to point out that I think it's very, very commendable there is a council tax freeze. That in itself will be very, very helpful to people. I only wish in another role I could have done the same there. Um, but it does make a difference to people and I think uh, what John was saying about the level of council tax over the last, uh, well, few years um, is worthy of note and it does need to be remembered. But of course, apart from the amendment, there are other things that we mustn't forget sight of. And that is, in my opinion only, um, getting the economy going, providing more jobs, higher value jobs and so on, is really, really crucial. So we can lift people's aspirations, particularly for those just entering the workforce, so um, they are able to be, I suppose, more economically independent. So as I said, I certainly welcome um, the amendment. It does, of course, go alongside the uh, work that Susie spoke about in public sector leaders that we put money in there. I think that would be very, very beneficial. 
There have been, and I know some people argue not enough, but there have been some significant rises in the state pension for next year and one or two other benefits. Uh, as I say, it's never enough. But there are other things that we should be doing, and maybe uh, I think there's reference to this in the, in the budget paper when it comes to social value and procurement and these sorts of things. We really, really, really do need to do far better in the public sector to support, I would say it here, certainly Mid-Suffolk and Suffolk PLC, but certainly UK PLC. Whilst we don't buy lots of food and drink here at Mid-Suffolk, nevertheless, other organisations across the public sector do, and if we are talking about carbon footprint reduction, so on, and saving food miles and so on, we need to start waking up a bit better and do something about it. We can all do that as individuals. We in our procurement should be looking at things like social value to make sure we maximise what we're doing with taxpayers' money to help keep the wealth and generate more and here. So just didn't want to lose sight of those things. It's not just about the amendment, as I say, I welcome it, but the other things that we need to be doing as well, and that was one of the reasons, Chairman, I asked about leisure facilities, and thanks, Julie, for the reply for that, because that all makes the area more attractive and that can reassure people. So there's a lot of very good positive messages in this budget, so I'm wholeheartedly behind it and um, look forward to perhaps having a unanimous vote. Now, that would be a, a really good thing to have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Richardson. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm actually going to say almost exactly what Councillor Passmore said, but I will, I'll try not to repeat myself too much. Um, I, I totally agree. I think there's, there's two kind of main points um, here for me. The first is around the freezing of council tax to begin with. And I, I totally agree with what Councillor Whitehead said at the beginning in terms of this being a very strong legacy. Uh, I know that for us as a district council, our component of the precept is not the largest. And so you, we can get into to arguments or debates about how much of a difference it will make if we put it up or, or, or don't. But actually looking back reflectively at those last seven years to put it up only by 8% across that time period and seeing or hearing um, the difference in terms of what the precept for the average band D might have been, I think is, is a really strong point. Um, and I think it reflects incredibly well on the finances of this council and how they've been managed over a number of years. But, and I, I take, um, obviously, happy that the administration has accepted the amendment, because I think that demonstrates the second point, is that not only have we managed to keep council tax low over a seven year period, we've done so while still investing in our communities, while still trying to grow the economy exactly as Councillor Passmore has said. There are quite a few exciting things coming down the track in Mid-Suffolk. Uh, Stone Market Health Education and Leisure Facility that's on the agenda is one. The Skills Innovation Centre at Gateway 14 is another. Um, and I'm, I think on this uh, last example, Councillor Acton, you'll agree with me that obviously one of the largest transfers in this budget is to Mid Suffolk Growth Limited, which will be continuing to deliver uh, affordable and high quality housing for our residents, all of which boosts our local economy. So I think that's a very strong legacy. I'm delighted to see that there seems to be a consensus growing in the Chamber, so I shall certainly be voting in favour of this budget. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Epignon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm grateful to uh, Councillor Richardson for talking about Mid-Suffolk growth, um, which has, I think, um, in, performed absolutely fantastically in terms of its remit to build high-quality housing accommodation for our residents. It's one plank of a series of economic measures that this council is a, has been able to pursue because of the way in which we've successfully managed this, the finances of this council. And the other element of this is the fact that we are in a position where uh, with our Gateway 14 project, not only have we achieved uh, many of our initial uh, objectives uh, in, up to now, but we're actually looking at a, a uh, and a business park that's going to generate thousands of jobs for our local community. And on the back of that, with the funds that we have available, we're going to be investing in skills to, to be able to support the businesses that are going to come to Gateway 14. And I think it's all part of a grand strategy to basically bring Mid-Suffolk up to a much higher level. And I think we should all welcome that. And I do appreciate the... Um, the amendment in terms of looking to help some of our communities that are not as well off as they, we would like them to be. But I think you know we should bear in mind that we're able to do that because of the, the sound finances that we've developed over the period. And it's on top of all the work that has already been going on to support our communities. So I welcome this budget, and I think that uh, 
it lays the background for us having a much more healthy, productive, and economically successful district council. So I commend the budget to everybody. Thank you very much. And I feel like we're at the end of debate now. So, oh, Councillor Flatman. Oh, you've already spoken, haven't you, Councillor Flatman? Um, I'll, I'll make an exception because I don't think there's many people. Councillor Geek, I'll, um, I will allow that because um, we've, we've had quite a short debate time. Councillor Geek. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to make the point that um, it's, it, it's, it's marvellous to hear people on, uh, on all sides of this chamber talking about um, an, a, a will to spend money to get services delivered and, uh, and work done. Um, we're, we on this side are very strongly in favour of doing that, of spending enough money to ensure the delivery of services to a high standard. And uh, I have been a councillor only for coming up to four years, but I keep hearing stuff about efficiency, that we need to trim and be efficient in a lean machine. And, and in fact, what I feel is that we can't even get the phones answered. The, the, the delivery of services to those who are really competent with a computer is, is, is marvellous. But for those, it's not going to all our people. And I'm hoping that, that, that we, we all seem very self-congratulatory. But um, I, I'm feeling that the, the actual delivery of our services is not as good as it could be. And, um, and, and, and we want to really get something done that, um, that, that, that makes a difference to people on the ground, whether or not they are happy online. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll, um, I'll allow Councillor Flatman to come back, but that will be the end of de debate unless somebody um, wants. Yeah, okay, Councillor Flatman. Cabinet Member for Communities, I'm very glad that I'm being given um, half a community and put it out there for our communities to spend for themselves. And the limit for each one will be 20,000, those who apply if they have, you know, the proof that there is need. And that's what we're here for, our communities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Morley. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Flatman's already mentioned the community grants funding that we've, we've just included. And this is... Uh, in addition to the locality funding, and the reason we've done it as a separate grant is because this will allow for both revenue and capital grants to be applied for, and also for feasibility studies, neither of which are currently allowed for under locality funding. So this is actually gonna make a really big difference to our communities, and, and they will be able to apply to us direct for this. And of course, the, the money, the amount is not as restricted as for a locality fund. Um, I'd just like to actually respond to Councillor Geek on her concerns around um, leaving behind those who are perhaps not so technically literate. And I'd just like to give you an example. The whole point of, of us becoming more agile and speedy is so that those who can serve themselves are able to do so. Those who can't, we can actually spend far more of our officers' time in looking after them. And I'd just like to give you an example, actually. Last week, Councillor Hicks contacted me with concerns about one of his residents. The following day, one of our officers was there on the doorstep looking after that resident and helping to resolve the issues that she'd had. And they were able to do that because most of the rest of the team were digitally enabled and supporting them from the back office and looking after both the officer out in the field and also the resident in her home. And I'm really proud that our teams responded in that way. The resident has had several phone calls and they've had people, 
our officers went out and bought things on their own credit card and took them to our resident in order to support her. And we are able to do that because we are digitally enabled and most of our officers have the wherewithal and the ability to think for themselves, to think on their feet and look after our residents when they need them. So I think this is a fantastic budget. I think this is, a, um, is going a long way to supporting all of our residents and I will certainly be supporting it. I will actually let Councillor Geek come back on that because I, I need to keep things fair and on that I've given someone two um, uh, so um, uh, you'll have two so um, if, if you could be brief though Councillor Geek and then it's Councillor Carter I'll be very brief it, that, that's a marvellous story but it should not take the intervention of a councillor mm. to do that whenever we intervene things happen fast people on their own have to end up going to a councillor and that's not right Thank you. Councillor Carter. Thank you. And how do I follow after that? It's, a, it's been a nice tete-a-tete. -tete. Um, um, it's been wonderful actually sitting here when we all actually seem to be following off the same hymn hin sheet. We were saying about to be uh, robustness of the economy, we need and be um, for budget, we need and be improvements. Two million pounds, wonderful. Um, and it would be wonderful as well if I could keep a thought in my head and it should come out of my mouth as well. Um, and we do need a strong economy and we need to have funds going in there, but we also do need to be doing more. So this amendment, this budget, where we are helping people, where we are trying our best to actually to get people in a situation where they can have a safe and secure home, where their, uh, their energy bills go down, it has a benefit of mental health, where you actually you know you can sleep at night, where you can actually feel in a secure place and there be able to get it out into the outside world. And if we are able to help more people, if we are able to aid in childcare, where actually allowing for somebody to actually have somewhere in place and safe and support where they then can go out and get join the workforce, where they then can actually get outside, uh, outside their own doors and add to the economy by earning and giving back. We're doing every little thing we can do which can help either, well, the, the hardest hit. If we can help them to help themselves and then they can get out and they can help others, then now I'm always going to be in favour of that. So £2 million, it's, it's, it's not peanuts but it's still a very small amount of what we have. And too many pounds is a starting block, and I hope we can build on it every time we do so. So I'm certainly in favour of this, and I'm in favour of any time we can go further than this as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd, I'd like to take this to the um, vote now, please. Um, <laughs> Councillor Whitehead, would you like to... Um, add anything? Well, um, I'd just like to say, I, I mean, I've described it as our budget, and I, I thank the finance team, but I think I'd also like to acknowledge the, um, you know, what a great set of uh, directors and corporate managers we have that have worked very hard to pull this budget together. I mean, many of us here don't, won't know if we're going to be here post early May, but I think what we do know is that we've got a great senior leadership team, a great set of officers and staff who I know will be enthusiastic and diligent in delivering this budget going forward and I thank them for it. Thank you. Thank you. I will now ask the Corporate Manager, Governance and Civic Office to conduct the recorded vote. Thank you, Chair. That vote is now showing in blue for councillors to cast the vote. It is showing with the amendment. So I, I will say at this point, in accordance with council procedure, um, the council procedure rules, these, this will be a recorded vote and it will go into the minutes as well as on the website. And um, that will be um, on the, in the minutes and the website shortly. Thank you.
Councillor Phillips, can I take your vote, please? Thank you. Chair, that is uni unanimous, 32 votes for. So that's carried, thank you. The next item on the agenda is item 10, MC 2236, the housing revenue account, um, 2023 to 24 budget. So I would like to invite Councillor Whitehead to introduce this item to move the amend and move the re rec recommendations in the report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Oh, well, follow that, eh? I'd now like to introduce our second budget report for 23-24, which covers a ring-fenced housing revenue account, report MC 2236. So this time last year, I reported how the previous two years during COVID pandemic had negatively impacted our housing revenue account. Lockdown measures and social distancing had seriously affected our maintenance repair program and seriously delayed our new build program. And since then, in increased inflationary pressures the cost of living crisis and material supply issues have created further significant headwinds. In December 22, I gave an update on the current year to Cabinet, which forecasts an adverse variance in the HRA of 770,000. We'll have a further update coming to Cabinet in the, on 6th of March. These are indeed challenging times, but let me be clear, <coughs> we remain steadfast in our vision to provide affordable and high quality homes that enable our tenants to build settled safe and healthy lives. As I explained and introduced in the general fund budget, we should normally look just beyond just one year when evaluating the sustainability of our budgets. And normally I would stress when introducing the HRA a similar theme that the HRA budget should be evaluated within the context of a 30 year HRA business plan. But this year is an exception, regrettably in my view, but necessary. The HRA budget that has been presented today is a one-year interim budget, which shows an in-year deficit of 816,000, with our HRA reserves forecast to be around 6.3 million at the start of the new year. We can handle such annual deficits in the short term, but deficit remaining at that level would wipe out our reserves in under, six, in, in under eight years. So clearly, this present situation is not sustainable over any extended time period. Therefore, before this calendar year 23 is out, members will be presented with a revised and updated 30-year HRA business plan, setting out a clear path to a position of long-term sustainability that will deliver our council's homes and housing strategy and deliver our council's vision for our tenants. A fully renewed plan will be delivered by our renewed, reinvigorated and refreshed housing team, led by our new housing director, Deborah Fenton. In this budget, we're facing various cost pressures totaling 4.058 million compared to last year's budget. And these are set out under 12 separate headings in Table 1. Set against those cost pressures, we have savings and additional income that total 3.147 million to leave a net deficit of between those two of 911,000. Members will see that we have some significant revenue increases proposed for the year are clearly set out within the recommendations in Section 3. The Government has shied away from its policy the last three years, which allowed rent increases of CPI plus 1%. Perhaps not surprisingly, with CPI reaching double digits recently, the Government's decided to mandate a rent cap of 7% for 23-24. Within the report, we've modelled scenarios based on lower increases of 3 and 5% in Table 4, but the hit to our HRA from those lower rent increases would be significant. Those lower rent increases would dramatically add to the significant challenges we already face in getting our HRA budget back to a long-term sustainability. So the decision to recommend a 7% rent increase is one that I believe will be in line with the general approach adopted for council house rents across the country. 
the rent increase is below the current level of inflation, and more importantly, given that about two-thirds of our tenants are on housing benefits, it is below the 10.1% level of benefit uplifts that are coming their way this April. I therefore believe that we can all, with a clear conscience, approve the various increases set out in Section 3. And I would therefore like to propose formally the recommendations and invite the Cabinet Member for Housing to second them. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haydenham. Thank you. I'm happy to second this. Um, approving an increase in anything is a challenging decision. To approve an increase in our rents is even more difficult. It is only a decision that is made with robust consideration and debate, especially at a time of the, co of a, of the cost of living crisis. For five years, the government implemented a, implemented a CPI 1% reduction in rents, and two years after this, we feel the impact on our housing revenue account. In addition, we have an ageing housing stock, which adds, adds significant strain to the repairs and maintenance bill. Retrofitting our homes to help with the environment and reduce our tenants' utility bills is vital. Without the rent increase, this will be at risk. With the increase in materials, which in some cases is 35%, we have a challenge in meeting the most basic repairs and maintenance. This is even before considering the green agenda and bringing our homes up to an EPC grade C and above. Members will also be hearing in the coming months about our proposal to develop a Creating Great Spaces scheme. This will be a significant investment each year in our communities, which will be led by the, te led by the tenants. Again, without the rent increase, this will be at risk. Um, through, through our transformation programme, our capital programme, which plans to replace kitchens, bathrooms, heating systems, windows and doors, is, and it, it's on course to start in April, without the rent increase, this programme will also be at risk. Some additional staff have been proposed in this budget this year, and these sit in the income team. Officers will have smaller patches, res resulting in being able to spend more time supporting tenants who are in, in arrears or at risk of arrears. Again, this will be at risk if the rent increases do not go ahead. 68% of our tenants are on benefits, so they do get support with the rent. Members, I know that approving these proposed rent increases will be difficult for you, and it's certainly difficult for me. But if we do not, the consequences for our residents are extensive. We must provide homes where people can flourish and ensure their homes are dry, safe and warm and with support when needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'll move to questions. Who would like to um, start that? So if there's no... Councillor Mansell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm surprised there weren't any more questions. I was not trying to be first. Um, I'd just like to question um, a couple of points in the report relating to right to buy. Um, I noticed that in um, section 4.9, um, You've ignored any, any um, tenants purchasing their uh, property under the right to buy scheme when it comes to your rental income. Um, and further down in the paper, um, when you're talking about the capital budget, um, you refer to um, building new homes, and there are some numbers there. I'd like to know if those are net gain or whether that's just the gross of four, uh, new homes we're going to be developing uh, or whether it takes into account the fact we might lose some through right to buy, given that the following paragraph 4.41, so, is it 4.4? No, not 4.41. Somewhere else it says, uh, 4.42 um, says that the, the numbers of right to buy sales um, seem to be higher than were anticipated in the previous budget. <coughs> so clearly they might be significant. So um, just a little bit of clarity on where it's ignored in some bits and not ignored in other bits. Councillor Whitehead. Um, yeah, I, I, do have, I do have my own concerns that we've put a zero figure in there, but basically it's a question of it's, you know, how long is a piece of string, really. Bearing in mind we've got over 3,000 houses, and it's usually around the sort of 20 mark. It's, it's not a significant figure. Obviously, there's a little bit of loss of income, and if it happens half through the year, it's half a year's income, not a whole year's income. Um, so um, it's, 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 it's difficult, difficult to answer, if not zero, what, whatever. Um, uh, in terms of the, the capital side, on the assumption that we're, we're seeing no loss there, then all the capital should be additional housing. But in reality, some must be replaced, because I'm, the chance of it being right to buy is zero is... Probably zero. 
about the question. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Field. Thank you. It always creates anguish putting someone else's rents up, I must admit. But I think what I'd really like to know is, um, were there any alternatives you consider? Is there really no other way of financing our short-term problems rather than sticking rents up and other charges up for some of the poorest people in, in the district by sort of seven percent which uh, is less than inflation thanks to the government but um, is still considerably more than people in that position are likely to receive as an income increase um, I, th I think that's my concern in a way is that we're uh, we're pushing up rents to improve or, or maintain the standards of an asset which belongs to us, the council. It's, I think its discounted value is, is somewhere in the £250 million pound bracket and, and obviously the market value is perhaps three times that. So it is a very substantial asset which belongs to this council, not the people whose rents we're increasing. So, so I personally you know, I only feel anguish but concern and uh, I would like to know what alternatives you looked at. Thank you. Councillor Whitehead. I, th I think when we first started looking at this, uh, you know, initial stage of the budget, I think it was sort of around about September when it was quite a bit of turmoil nationally, but at that point we thought the rent would go by CPI plus 1%. There was debate nationally ah. about whether benefits would be not inflated as usual. So I think at that stage we were looking perhaps Low benefit increases, CPI plus one percent rent, and anguish. <laughs> and then, as we go up through into December and beyond the consultation, we then seem to flip that on its side to be seven percent rent cap, and benefits increased in, in line with inflation. So, certainly from my point of view, I, I've sort of moved from anguish to relatively calm about it. But uh, you know, it, it's each, each, to the, each individual has to sort of make that own assessment, I guess. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see any further questions. Councillor Carter. I had wondered if the increase does get to a point where somebody isn't able to uh, financially manage any further, what loss are we like to do? Should there be intervention then to actually prevent it going further? Obviously, we'd have to subsidise it. There's going to be officer time, there's going to be time and cost into doing this, so there's going to be office costs. So are we going to be making any benefit from that if we're putting anyone in a position where we aren't able to do, aren't able to cope? And also, if it's going to have additional stresses on individuals, especially with the targeting, we are targeting individuals who are at least, at least able to support themselves, um, what, we are putting our problem then, if it's going to have additional um, implications to there's going to be implications to mental health there's going to be implications to um, to individuals be uh, well there are likely to be further interventions outside of the council possibly health interventions there might be interventions from antisocial where might actually drive though if it would further so are we not then spreading out regaining our cost but spreading the cost over a wider community which in the end would actually further costs to ourselves later so are we really doing the correct thing it, it, targeting those individuals regardless of benefits rising and falling it's not exactly rising to be in a, a complete even platform with everybody else we're still it, the benefits are still going to be lower off and special social housing and uh, the it's not, it's not actually gains from them we're still taking. So how are we going to recap this if it's going to cost inter intervention, if it's going to be an issue, and how are we going to recap it? Well, outside of the thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you. Um, Councillor, make, Councillor Carter makes um, well-made points, and I certainly understand the... The, you know, the, qu the questions and the concerns he's raising. I mean, in terms of how we're going to handle it, the processes um, at, 
I'd like to perhaps invite um, uh, Deborah Fenton as our housing director. Perhaps just make a few comments, if she, if she would. Thank you. Director Housing. Thank you. So we have purchased some software um, called RentSense, which enables us to use an analytical tool to um, predict not only uh, people who are going to go into rent arrears, but, but it helps us um, distinguish those people who are, um, you know, really struggling. So, so what, what that effectively means is that the caseloads for officers will then reduce and they've got more time to spend with those individual tenants who need support and help to maximise their income. Um, we'll also be working with colleagues in um, communities and um, also our other housing teams and um, we, we need to have a better presence out there in all our communities so, so our officers need to be out there so that will that will help in terms of ASB um, and, and neighbourhood issues and of course we have got officers in our um, housing solutions team which are uh, a tenure blind so they can help both um, tenants and um, you know people who are, who are not tenants um, and support them in making sure their benefits are maximised and um, finally um, we, we are aware that benefits are increasing um, the, the percentage is higher than the than rent so um, at least that gives them a little bit um, a, a little bit more income to play with although that said of course heating bills um, etc are all um, increasing um, so, 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 you know, we will be providing that support. Thank you very much. So it's Councillor Matheson, followed by Councillor Scarf. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have asked this before, this debate a year ago, no doubt, amongst other places in briefings and so on. The, the, the amount of money we charge from the um, public realm team across into the HRA um, it seems to me that quite a lot of that um, provides a benefit to the public at large in, in looking after the green spaces between the, the houses and because um, obviously they benefit other, other people beyond our housing estates and of course um, those estates have got a significant amount of, of right to buy um, privately owned properties amongst them as well. So the question really to officers is um, have we tried even harder than before to identify um, costs which we can bear in the general fund and not charge across to the HRA? Director Housing. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for the question. So this question has been raised um, recently and um, sub subsequently I have done some research looking at the Housing Act and um, we can in fact um, um, transfer money from the general fund to the HRA for the use of um, you know, the, 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 the HRA land. Um, I, I, I need to do an exercise on that with um, the Director of Operations just to understand um, what that looks like and then of course we'll, we'll need to consult with our colleagues in finance um, and, and, and bring that forward as a proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scarf. Thank you, Chair. Um, page 99 refers to the right to buy sales <coughs> and how we can um, retain 40% contribution towards the cost of a replacement home. Um, one of the key points at the bottom of the paragraph is if the receipts that we receive from the right to buy are not spent within the five-year period allowed, um, and that's just been increased from three to five years by the government, which I think is good, they must be repaid to the government with 4% above the base rate interest added. Can I seek assurance that this council is not in danger of ever handing any money back with 4% interest above the base rate to, to uh, central government? Because I think that would be an absolute disaster. To my knowledge, I don't think we ever have, but can I just seek reassurance that we haven't? 
Uh, would you like the director housing to? Um, I'll, I'll say something about Councillor yeah. Whitehead. I mean, I think um, it certainly incentivised to ensure that that doesn't happen. And certainly going forward, I wouldn't anticipate it happening. But if the director of housing wants to add anything further, I'm happy to. Director better. housing. So we do have a development programme, so it's always our ambition not to hand any money um, back to um, central government, even more so because we have to pay um, interest on it. However, we do, have, um, we, do, we do have something else we could do if, if all else failed and we weren't able to fund um, a development programme. Um, and of course, that development programme is only funded through borrowing, which, which we, you know, which is um, is enabled by us bringing the rent in. So, a very pertinent um, conversation this evening. Um, what we can do with those receipts is we can gift them to um, local housing associations, which will provide housing for local people. And um, through doing that, we can secure the. Um, nomination rights however that is a, a final resort a last well a last well in fact giving the money back is a last resort but so, so if we can't build ourselves we would always um look for a, a partner thank you very much and i don't think there's any further questions so i'd like to move to debate the normal rules apply three minutes and um speaking once would anyone like to um start that off so, in the absence of... Oh, Councillor Mellon. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I probably think I should say something here. Um, it, it does feel a bit uncomfortable to be, um, to be voting for a 7% rise in, in council tax rents uh, when, when we haven't raised council tax itself. And, um, but I do understand the, the, the separateness of those two parts of the council's finances and the rules around the HRA which prevent us from uh, you know, perhaps doing what we would like to do. Um, I accept this is a, a one year interim budget and that we're going to review the 30 year business plan which seems like a, a great idea now that we've got a new director in place. Um, I do hope that the government will review the rules around the HRA over the longer term so we can be more creative about how we fund this important area of our, our work but um, on the basis of um, of what I've heard, I'm happy to vote for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, we'll take that to the we'll take that to the um, the vote, please. Um, I will now ask the corporate manager, governance, and civic office to conduct the electronic vote, and I'll say again that this will be recorded in the um, minutes and on the website. Thank you, Chair. That is showing in blue for councillors to cast their vote. <coughs> Councillor Phillips, can I take your vote? Thank you. Chair, that is 25 votes for and seven against. Thank you very much. So that is carried. And um, we've been in the meeting for an hour and a half now. Would anyone like to take a uh, short comfort break? Yes, so your hands have gone up. Um, is five minutes enough? Does anybody need longer than five minutes? Yeah, everyone's happy. Okay. Well,
Thank you and welcome back, um, those that are watching um, live. Um, the next item on the agenda is 11, MC 2237, case for a new joint depot. So I would, I'd like to um, keep as much of this debate as possible in the open session for transparency. Um, the, um, if um, uh, councillors wish to discuss the breakdown of the 12 million, um, I personally don't think that's necessary because this is just a um, recommendation to look into it and start dealing with it. But um, we will have to go into closed session if that's the case. But um, I'd invite councillors to um, put their hand up and say they want to do something within closed session. But um, so, um, Councillor Gould, would you like to introduce this item and to move the recommendations on the report, please? Thank you very much, Mr Chairman, and thank you also for your uh, opening uh, comments on, on what this paper is about. Uh, and uh, let's keep it, if we can, in, in part one of the agenda. Uh, I wanted to start by setting out the compelling reasons uh, to make this move uh, and then focus on the, the single decision that we need to uh, take uh, this evening. Now, uh, we have uh, across um, the, the two districts uh, two waste uh, and public realm depots, one at Stone Market, one in Sudbury, uh, with the building services uh, mainly operating out of a smaller depot at Great Wenham. Now, the reasons for making uh, these cha this change are, th are these. Both of those depots, main depots, are 50 years old and no longer fit uh, for purpose. Uh, maintaining them is becoming increasingly expensive. The sites themselves are becoming obsolete due to their layout and the number of operations now being conducted there. Uh, the expanding population within our district uh, has seen a, an enormous growth in number of properties, population uh, in, the next, in the last few years, with uh, that projected to increase uh, yet further. So the demand for service to be supplied by those, from those depots is tremendously increased. Uh, the uh, resource and waste strategy uh, represents a particular challenge uh, for us. This includes the introduction of separate household waste collections the collection of glass from the curbside, segregated fibres and containers, and there could be a need for similar changes to our business waste collections also. These changes uh, will put further pressures on the existing depot estate and will constrain the services that can be delivered from them. Uh, operational service savings and income generation could be delivered in the order of 75 to 150,000 pounds per annum from having a single shared depot. Uh, a new depot uh, would improve staff wellbeing by providing a modern, fit-for-purpose accommodation that meets operational needs and aids working effectively uh, and efficiently. And you'll note in the report that there's been a, uh, a staff uh, working group involved in the development of the uh, initial proposal and that will follow through as the process continues. Uh, and that staff group has been in support uh, of the, this initial business case. Now, having, um, in order to move forward, we need significant uh, capital investment uh, of the order of 12 million across the two, the two districts. Uh, now this, at this stage, what we're asking, and the recommendation is a simple one, is to ask that we make that provision uh, within the council's uh, budget. So for Mid-Suffolk, this is a uh, provision of £6 million. Uh, this isn't a commitment to spend that amount, but if we don't uh, earmark those funds, if we don't uh, make that provision within the budget, uh, we won't be able to deliver what we must inevitably deliver in terms of improved depot. Now, we don't, what isn't presented in this report is the, the solution. Um, at this stage, all we're asking for is that that capital provision be made uh, 
so that the council uh, is able to uh, start to build up a business case uh, and consider the options. So as t picking up on the chairman's opening remarks, as tempting as it might be, and I'm sure we're all experts when it comes to depots, as tempting as that might be, actually let us just focus on that uh, single uh, uh, proposal, which is to make the capital provision at this stage. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. Could I have a seconder? Councillor Fleming. I'm happy to second the um, proposal. And um, I'll just say a few words at this point, if I may. Um, <clears throat> I think Councillor Gold has very well voiced the arguments for having a single depot between the two councils. And I think that really involves putting oneself in the shoes of the people who operate the depots that we've got. I think if you ask any of them, they would be um, delighted at the prospect of a single new efficient um, depot. Um, we already share a lot of the equipment, a lot of the fuel, and um, a lot of the staff. It makes so much sense. And as Councillor Gold has said, with RAWs coming up, that's the waste um, <coughs> resource strategy that the government is bringing in in the next few years. This will mean enormous investment in wherever the waste is brought. We will have food waste, um, you know, <coughs> maybe glass, goodness knows what. It will all be done differently, as we believe, and um, new facilities will be needed in any case. Um, the location, obviously, is in the future, but um, clearly we have the support of Baba District Council, and um, this will be a cooperative effort, as it should be. Um, the council has already also voiced support for a shared site. And therefore, I welcome this investment and believe it is without doubt the best option for the council to pursue. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll now move to questions. Are there any questions? Councillor Mansell. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, first one is the fact that this report is titled The Case for a New Joint Depot. And yet, when I scroll down to the recommendations, it says that we're recommending, or we're going to be voting later on tonight, that we put aside six million to deliver improved depot facilities. That's number 4.1. And 4.2 says that any capital receipts from the disposal of the existing depot sites will be added to the capital repayments. Now, 4.1 doesn't actually say that we're having a new depot. So surely number 4.2 should actually say that if we do dispose of any sites, the capital receipts should go into the budget because we don't know what's gonna happen yet. As has been explained by um, Councillor Gould, um, we don't really know. We're just putting aside the money at the moment. We're not sure exactly what we're going to get. So I just, um, maybe I'm being a little bit pedantic, but we're not voting to actually have one depot. We're voting to deliver an improved depot facility. So therefore, we may not be selling anything. And my other query uh, is actually on the restricted papers, but doesn't refer to any finance. So am I allowed to ask about it? Yeah, that's, that's um, fine. There's something yeah. about the um, building um, design proposal doesn't include any cycle parking facilities. So I would hope that should we have an improved depot facility that we do accommodate pedestrians and cyclists as well as car users. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's a couple of points there, but um, would you like to speak to that, Councillor Gould, or yeah. would you like to just take that on board? Uh, I'm, I'm sure the latter point will be taken on board, but the, the, the reason, uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't accuse you of being pedantic at all, uh, Councillor Mansell, what we're not doing here is uh, pres prescribing what the outcome will be. We have a good sense of where this is going to end up, and where it seems a very sensible uh, point to aim for, but actually it is, and uh, there is an open question there about what conclusions the further work provided we make the provision to enable us to do that, uh, where that 
the conclusions that we'll draw. And it'll be about opportunity, it'll be about how the business case develops. So, uh, yeah, I understand the point you're making, but uh, claim there is some deliberation, in, a bit deliberate uh, uh, aspect to that, in that we're, we're not prescribing exactly where we're going to end up, but we have a good sense of it. That makes sense. Thanks. Councillor Gould, we can, um, we can deal with a bit of that by just adding a little bit to the recommendation. In um, recommendation two, if that became any capital receipts from the disposal of existing depot sites will be added, would that satisfy... Thank you with that, um, um, yes. Councillor Fleming is the seconder. That's fine. Okay, so we'll amend that and um, carry on with questions. Councillor Emma Rayson. Thanks, Chair. I would just wonder if, on the same sentence, the addition of instead of will should be would. I'm not sure I can give the same opinion on pedantry uh, at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Field. Thank you, Chair. Um, wondered just uh, since it's easy to get confused among the numbers uh, could you be make it quite clear what the ongoing cost or saving to this council will be should we move along this route that's one issue the, the second issue is uh, when reading the uh, restricted papers one did come to some concern at some of the numbers let's say the, the, the land valuations mentioned seemed odd. So I appreciate we can't perhaps <coughs> discuss the actual values, but is there any assurance that should we put away this uh, lump sum at the moment, the, the provision, that should you discover somewhat more sensible and lower cost methods of achieving these ends, that we will not build ourselves a palace to use the available money? Thank you. Okay, Councillor Gould. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I'd, I'd start to address the first point and then ask the officers to, to, to deal with anything left over from that and the, and the second point. I mean, I, my introduction, I, I gave a sort of bandwidth of, of potential operational savings of 75 to 100, 150,000, but um, I don't know if, if the Director of Assets and Investments uh, wants to add to that and indeed answer your second question. Yes, certainly. Thank you for the question. Um, so the, the net impact um, that we've looked at, um, which looks at the financing costs for borrowing um, and then the potential savings from the uh, operations moving to a single uh, uh, depot. Um, so the net impact, best case scenario, £13,000 per annum, averagely. Uh, worst case scenario, uh, around about 163 thousand pounds per annum um, net impact um, and that's primarily the the cost of borrowing yes thank you councillor matheson thank you chair um yeah without straying too far into the um into the the um, appendix um how um how is it decided that that a number of different services were uh, included in the um, in arguing the case for a new depot without saying which they are which might take us a little further in the direction that you don't want to go um, so how, how did you know how did we come to put all those in there um, as they are very different to one another direct assets and investments Thank you. Um, those are the services that currently use our existing depots. Um, so we're really looking at a, a kind of like-for-like -like, uh, replacement in terms of uh, moving the existing services from the, the current premises into um, new facilities. So that's really um, where those groups were, um, were drawn from. Thank you. Um, Councillor Field, do you want to come back? I'm <coughs> yeah, sorry I, I missed don't, your hand. don't think I got a second, an answer to the second part of the question. Okay. That's been a bit panned down here, I would, suppose. Would you like to re-ask, briefly re-ask that second question? 
please. Yes, uh, it was the issue of trying to ask it as well in a way that doesn't get us into hot water. But uh, uh, there are various estimates in your, your papers which include, uh, obviously there are many elements to erecting a, a, a depot and providing a large area for vehicles. Um, the land values you're assuming seem to me to be a number of times the values for which we bought Gateway 14 as an example. So I just wondered how we justify that and my question was actually can we ensure that should those things prove to be just a, an estimate that we don't actually spend the money? Thank you. Director Assets and Investments. Thank you. So I can um, confirm we won't build a palace which I think is what you refer to in your question. <laughs> Um, in terms of budgets, obviously, we're having to um, make some assumptions and some estimates um, in relation to uh, values at a future point in time, um, including uh, looking at bill costs. Now, we all know bill costs have been um, quite um, difficult to predict over uh, recent um, times. Um, and so you know, we're making a best guess, in effect, using our professional experience terms of what um, what we're likely to need um, from a value perspective. Um, we've looked at other sort of similar facilities um, and looked at their total cost. So I think we've looked at it in terms of a breakdown, which we provided in terms of the, the guide within the, the business case, but also tried to sort of sanity check it in terms of that overall number. So we think that 12 million is probably about, about right. We may have estimated a little more on land value or on not quite enough on professional fees or you know however that um, comes out in the wash um, your point around gateway 14 um, and the price we paid for that obviously that was a much larger site without any services and so the costs of adding those services uh, need to be considered so um, the values that we've included within the um, report are more akin to a fully serviced site rather than in the case of Gateway 14 when we bought that unserviced land effectively. So it's, it's looking at those, at those differences. But I think the importance really is that total number, so the, the 12 million pounds and the sort of sensitivity testing we put within the, um, the papers to sort of look at what, you know, what the, the broad budget need, needs to be. Obviously, as we move forward, we'll get into looking at the detailed options that are available to us. Um, and that might mean that we need to consider larger sites um, in order to secure a site in the right location. And, and we'll get into that detail in, in, in due course. But at this point in time, um, we believe that's a reasonable estimate in terms of the, the capital budget that we need to deliver this project. Thank you, and um, we are in danger of um, looking too much into this. This should be a question of, is it enough money, um, not are the estimates exactly where we want them to be, because the purpose of this is to start looking into that properly with actual areas of land. So um, I'll move on to um, Councillor Mellon. Yeah, thank you, Chair. A um, couple of quick questions then. Does the decision today on the funding commit us um, irrevocably, irrevocably, if I can say it, to a single depot? Or is there that ambiguity that you've, you've outlined, does that cover the possibility of a different outcome? Uh, and secondly, in making the case for a single depot, have we taken into consideration the, the travel time for people working there to get to work uh, in a single site rock compared to multiple sites? Uh, are we in danger of sort of uh, externalising some of our costs onto the staff travelling in? Councillor Gould. Thank you. Thank you for the question, uh, questions, Councillor. Uh, first, um, no, we're not bound to that, to that particular answer, uh, you know, solution. Right? It is what we believe and expect to be the case, but uh, there might be an alternative. And our... Uh, once we've agreed to commit this money and we're able to start the development of the next stage of the business case, uh, those options uh, can, be, can be assessed. So we may well uh, not only come to the conclusion that this single depot is the right answer, 
but we know why it's the right answer compared to the, uh, compared to the others. Issues um, uh, of travel time, uh, both for the employees and in question about the conduct of the operations, is a wonderfully complex set of questions that uh, thankfully we don't have to address this evening and that as the business case develops and those options are explored, then uh, I'm sure, you know, it'll all become very clear what the best answer is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Warboys. Thank you, Chair. Yes, just, just one question. Um, would this be a, a suitable point as to actually sort of um, consider the provision of household recycling depots as well? I, in my opinion, that I am having one in Stone Market where Mid Suffolk District Council is the largest one in the country, I think, in terms of area, and having one position at one <coughs> end of it, whereas one near I might be very, very useful for residents. Councillor Gould. Ooh, he's trying to make it very tricky, isn't he? <laughs> 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 uh, this is, of course, a matter for the County Council. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and this matter is complicated enough as it stands, so mm. nice try, but I think let's focus on the matter before us, which is to, I, I hope, agree to make this provision so that we can develop the business case for the depot. Thank you. Councillor Stringer. Yeah, thank you. I uh, don't want to echo something, but I, I, I would just make the plea that if we're at a very early stage with this, that, that don't just rule out things that, that might actually be absolutely brilliant. I've long thought that a household waste recycling centre at the very place where our brilliant waste service operates out of would be a huge opportunity to get brilliant messages out there about reuse and recycling, etc., etc. Uh, so, and also, if nothing but for the sake of the legs and the spines of the people of Mid-Suffolk, to get a, a site that's on a slope so you don't have to climb a wretched metal staircase with stuff teetering on your back uh, just to put it in a bin where most household recycling centres now are on split level sites to help people with that and, and actually make their use that much easier. So let's not rule it in, but please can we not rule it out? Because if we did find that site, that I think that would be a huge benefit to at least explore that option and not rule it out now. And also to say that the site's going to be really quite crucial because we were suggesting about we're doing this for staff wellbeing. But at the moment, of course, the existing depot in Mid Suffolk is superbly located for transport in terms of you, can, you almost fall off a railway platform when you're there. Uh, and it's very, very well connected with, with cycling as well. So there's, there's a whole element of, of uh, it's a real difficult thing to ask, and I don't want to heap loads of wants on it, but let's just not rule things out because we could actually come up with something brilliant on all sides. Thank you. Councillor Gould. Thanks. Uh, well, well, this, uh, this administration is not, certainly not adverse to brilliance, as many of our achievements uh, show, Councillor Stringer. So, uh, and if, if um, I think a good thing about the process here is that we're not saying that's where we're going and, and all other options and possibilities have been ignored. We're going about this in absolutely the right way. It brings together the uh, expertise, including that, of the people doing the job on the ground, which I think uh, Councillor Fleming referred to in her in second in motion. You know, the involvement of, 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 of the staff is, is important, um, a part of developing a, a right and, and, if available, a brilliant answer to this. So, we're not adverse to that, um, and I'm sure uh, any possibilities, without losing focus on what this is actually about, because it's very easy to get distracted in all sorts of kind of attractive possibilities and, and miss the point of it. So we remain focused on, de on delivering what we need to deliver, but at all, not, not uh, at the expense of uh, a very good idea. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Morrison, did you have something, a question? Thank you. Um, I do feel like to, to, <coughs> to um, sort of tacitly agree to this kind of uh, consolidation and efficiency drive in these kind of matters, that there's uh, 
the elephant in the room is always the potential impact on sort of human and labor uh, security. Uh, so what uh, do we want to do we want to acknowledge that um, aspect of it and um, what uh, impact do you think a consolidation um, strategy might have on that? Councillor Gould. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm going to make sure I'm understanding it first, which is you're talking about impact on jobs. Yeah. Is, that what you're, yeah. is that what you're asking? Um, well, the, of course, our job as a council is to deliver services and we employ people in order to deliver those services. The pressures and constraints are on and the places an obligation on us to be operated as efficiently as, as we can. Uh, but also, part of what we're doing all the time, and we heard about um, Gateway 14 a little earlier, is generating jobs within the area, uh, within our district. And we're very proud about achievements in that score. In terms of the depots uh, them, themselves, well, it may well be that uh, we're not set starting with, uh, with, with staffing targets in relation to this. Again, that's a function of the solution that we come up with. Uh, it may well be that uh, the sites are repurposed, sold, reused, uh, occupied by businesses, which may well generate, uh, produce a net increase in the number of jobs uh, within the district just by itself. So um, I understand what you're saying. We're sensitive to it. Uh, it, is, it is in our minds, of course it is, uh, and the involvement of staff in discussion about the proposals is a key key part of that. Thank you. Councillor Fleming. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, <clears throat> take up the point made by um, Councillor Stringer actually on the um, household waste recycling aspect because clearly that isn't a district council function. Um, it's a county council function but the district councils all work very closely with the county council and um, I think taking this um, forward, this needs to be discussed at the Suffolk Waste Partnership level and so that all of the partners involved in managing waste in the county can see, you know, put this two and two together. Anyone who's been to the Berry Ruffin site will see how very well that site works, which is both a depot and a household waste recycling site combined. Um, it does, however, have the advantage of an enormous space which the um, <coughs> council was able to acquire a few years ago. Um, I doubt whether we'll be so lucky in this instance. However, I would like to see us focus on the, the, the whole aspect of waste management, um, collection, recycling, reuse, repair, all of those things need to be you know, w within our sites here and we need to be working together with our partners. So I welcome your comments, Councillor Stringer. Thank you very much. And I will now move to debate. Um, the um, same rules apply as always, three minutes, and please speak only once. Um, would anybody like to start the debate? Councillor Matheson. I all, my, all my points um, <laughs> in the one intervention. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the... Um, whoever decided to provide us with, with quite a detailed um, uh, sort of state of, of the thinking on, the, on this topic in the appendix. So that, that's very useful to, to see the, you know, how far that has evolved. Um, now, I did just ask a question about the, um, about the four different services. And um, as, as far as the... the waste and recycling sites concerned um you know the, the the need is undoubted the creating you know creating is is inadequate and um the, the creating road there's no no doubt in my mind at all about that um the government are, are um, promising extra waste streams to be dealt with I welcome that um and, and welcome that the thinking is is being put into that um however uh, am I allowed to say how many different services there are being considered? It's in the main report. 
Sorry? If you if you need right, to, okay. if so, you so don't need to, please we're, don't we're, go into. We're talking about we're talking about four, four different services um, all, all together in in this proposition, but they they've I think they've been prematurely rolled to, together, and um, so I th I think finally that um, that really we need a, a task and finish group of, of members and officers from the two councils um, to to really sit down and. Um, and you know, work out what additional information and so forth is, um, is, is needed, um, such as, as the point that's been made about the travel times and so on. And, and there are many, many, many other um, aspects that will need some further thought. But it, it's good to see that we can see the thinking that is there so far. Thank you. Thank you. Any other people for debate? Councillor Mellon. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, mean, I, I will vote for this um, because I can see clearly now, thank you to um, Councillor Gould, that it is simply about um, uh, you know, giving a push to, to the funds and, and, and putting that in place. Um, I, I do think reading through the, the papers, um, it, we are talking about a, a very big area with the two councils. You know, you've got right from Fressingfield in the north to, to Shotley and, and Sudbury, is a big area to cover with one depot and, and I couldn't really grasp um, how necessarily uh, there would be less travel uh, on, from one site. Though clearly I do accept that you know, our waste does come to one area to be dealt with which is you know, the, the energy from waste plant or, or the MRF. Um, so clearly there's a case there, I think it could be made uh, and, and explored a bit better. Uh, I do think some member involvement in this process might be helpful. I know it's an officer group at the moment. Occasionally we're able to bring um, some useful information, um, but I think I've heard enough uh, on the basis of what we've, we've discussed already uh, to vote in favour of this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Mansell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, um, in a way, I'm quite pleased that the actual recommendations that we'll be voting on are not tying us down to anything specific. Um, as Councillor Matheson has said, we have actually been given quite a lot of quite detailed information and thought processes. And what concerns me is really that, that we might bl be too blinkered because we're only going to look at that one particular um, sort of suggestion that has, we've got all the detail for. And, and yes, historically, those, those services, waste services, building services, repairs and car parking have per chance all ended up on our one depot site. But I don't, that seems that it just happened that way and it wasn't engineered that way. And I, I really think that whilst I can support the recommendations as they are worded, that we are to, to put six million towards improving our depot facilities. I really think that we do need to have a serious think about whether it is the best thing for building services, repairs and car parking to be co-located with waste. I can really see the advantage of having a single waste depot. Ideally, if it's next to somewhere where the waste is gonna end up, that would be fa fantastic. But I'm not convinced, I have yet to be convinced, that having a single depot for our building services to cover, as Councillor Mellon has said, a vast area from Fressing Field to Great Cornard to Shotley is the best option. Uh, we're told about operational cost. There's quite a lot of detail. Even in the, in the public report, uh, there are some sort of uh, ballpark figures of what the operational costs will will be better because we're in a single depot. But I can't, maybe I don't read things, I do skim read, I have an awful lot of things to read. But I can't see where the travel um, carbon footprint, the travel time, the ease of access for employers and anyone else who wants to go there is going to be better if we have a single depot in the middle somewhere of our big, big area. So I, I, I will vote for it, but only because those wordings of the recommendations are suitably vague. 
And I do think that some thought needs to go in to whether that really is the best option to put, put those little building services vans in the same place as the waste tankers, because uh, I've yet to be convinced. But I think I'm happy that we put some money aside for, some, for something to happen, and presumably um, the decision of what actually happens will come back to council, um, and who knows if we're all still here or not. Could but, you um, wrap up now? Yeah. You but anyway, I, I, I will vote Thank for it, you. but only because it's, it's suitably vague, and Thank we're not you. tying ourselves down, please. Councillor Warboys. It, well, um, I think Councillor Mansell said much of what I was going to say. I, um, I agree completely with the motion. I'm quite happy to support it. Um, it does indicate a direction of travel. Uh, I agree with what's been told us about the uh, fitness for purpose of the current depot and stone market. I'm familiar with that. I don't know about the, the um, greeting one. Um, um, Services need, deserve, I think, uh, a depot that's fit for purpose for the well-being of the staff, that's easy to operate, efficient, and the site in, in Stone Market simply isn't big enough, I think, to sort of manage uh, the demands that are going to be put on it. I'm not completely convinced about the case for a single depot, uh, largely because of the logistics of the travel concern. Um, we, at current, we, we run in vehicles on HVO. It has been mentioned that we might be using electrical vehicles or hydrogen powered. I, there are issues there in terms of range and charging, which could well affect where a depot is site simply in order to be able to access the area it's servicing. Uh, so I think that our case for a single depot needs to be examined really carefully and alternatives looked at as well in terms of the logistics. Um, so that's my point. I will support it. I think it does indicate a, a good direction of travel. Thank you very much. Councillor Field, followed by Councillor Parsmore. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll try and keep it short. Um, really, Clearly, waste at the moment is, is, is in a state of flux, waste collection. It, it, the government is driving change, and it's change that uh, largely one would support. Uh, so that's eminently sensible. Clearly, we have to look at the configuration of our services in, in light of that. Uh, and clearly, depots that are built a long time ago probably don't match the, the equipment we have now, or perhaps even the staff. So one's totally behind the thought that we should look at this carefully uh, and that we should have some estimate with a sensible sum of money that we should put on one side to do that job. So largely one will support it. I, I suppose the fear I have always, and it's, it's been expressed in various other ways, is that when one approaches something like this, you make a quick guess at what might be the solution, uh, dream up a paper with quite a lot of detail that looks, looks quite professional, um, and then from then on you get to the point where you collect evidence to support the decision you or the conclusion you jump to in the first place uh, therefore it has to be a single depot therefore we have to put all services together and I think what I will be counselling against and I think my colleagues have expressed to an extent is that we shouldn't do that we should try and be open-minded we should make sure the choices we make are good choices as we go through that the very fact that we said one depot doesn't mean we have to have that. We lose place if we, we don't. There are other options and we consider those other options. Make sure we get as best a conclusion as we can at the end of it all. Thank you. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Councillor Parsnall. Uh, thank you very much, James. I'll be very quick. Well, I've got no hesitation in supporting this motion. I think, you know, the depots, as we heard, have passed a sell-by date. We've got to future-proof it. What are the recycling things going to be in the future? The capacity of expanding population, as is in the paper. And I'm sure, I'm very confident, actually, common sense will apply to looking at all the issues that people have mentioned. I know the officers will do that. Well done. Um, and then we can come to a, a sensible solution. So there's a lot in there. And I believe I'm right in saying when Baber and Mid-Suffolk came together 
to have a joint round um, with, with um, commercial contractors. That was the first example in the country. Some of us might remember that. Um, it was brand new, really innovative, and I think this approach is going to show that we are innovative once again as a council leading the way. So let's just buck up and get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Amorosan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I've got some experience in this a little bit. I used to live in uh, Surrey, in, in Rygate, and just outside of Rygate, they had they'd done this. They had consolidated the waste depot, uh, recycling, and um, a, lot, a lot of council-owned offices where there were lots of unrelated activities uh, housed as well. And um, and it's a, it might sound like a small point, but it was really smelly to, to be to have all the offices in that in that area. And eventually, um, they invested uh, lots of money for a new a new uh, facility in the centre of town for for the uh, for the for the staff and the um, the uh, unrelated services and separated the two sites. Um, and everyone uh, breathed a sigh of relief. Uh, so, just a, a, a kind of a cautionary tale, really. So. But I, I will support this uh, uh, this motion. Order. Thank you. And I think that's the end of the debate there. So um, I'd like to um, move on to the vote. So, I will now ask the Corporate Manager, Governance and Civic Office to conduct their electronic vote. Thank you, Chair. That is showing in blue with the added word, any capital receipts, for you to cast your vote. Councillor Phillips, can I take your vote for? Thank you. Thank you, that's a unanimous decision for, and um, so that's carried. Thank you very much. And we'll now move on to item 12, MC 2238, Stowmarket Health, Education and Leisure Facility, known as SHELF, um, the update. Again, this is something that I'd like to keep in a normal meeting. I, I don't want to, at this stage, go into um, the pink papers in it, but should anyone think that's really necessary, we will do it and um, we'll, um, we'll deal with that. Please let me know. But um, I'd like to invite Councillor Richardson to introduce this item and move the recommendations on the report. Councillor Richardson. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce this report and to propose the recommendations contained within it. Uh, as members will be aware, the Stowmarket Health, Education and Leisure Facility is an ambitious scheme in the heart of our district that will significantly enhance the amenities available to our residents. Uh, this includes a new sports pavilion, wellbeing hub, athletics track and a range of sport and leisure facilities. Uh, the purpose of this report, though, is to provide an update to members and to ask the Council to authorise the funding of £250,000 to progress this project to its next, next phase, which will be a formal planning application. Since this Council approved the initial business case last summer, extensive public consultation has taken place, including at our well-attended What Next for So Market events uh, in September, uh, which has garnered overwhelmingly positive feedback from the community. Uh, we have also reached the point of a design freeze for the scheme and the details for both of these elements can be found in the appendices uh, in the, the public section. 
Uh, I should emphasise, though, that if members do approve these recommendations in this report, uh, this will absolutely not be the last time that this uh, project comes before the Council. Uh, if and hopefully when a planning permission is obtained, uh, then the intention is for a full business case to be brought back to the Council uh, for approval, which will include full details on both the proposed funding strategy and the operating model for the future. Uh, we do have uh, officers and the architect for the scheme present, uh, who will be happy to take any questions if, if there are any, um, but I would again like to thank them for all of their work to date to help progress this scheme, and indeed to the members of the working group who have helped to guide the scheme in its development. Uh, finally then, I will just sum up and say that in approving this report, uh, we would be passing uh, an important hurdle uh, in making this project a reality, and so I hope uh, councillors will vote for the recommendations this evening, which I'm happy to propose. Uh, and as Campbell, uh, Cabinet Member for Communities, Health and Wellbeing, I'd like to invite Councillor Flatman to second the recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flatman. Thank you very much. So we'll move to questions. Um, who would like to start? Councillor Pratt. Yeah, just a really quick one to begin with. Um, I just wondered, uh, given my um, non-pecuniary interest as a teacher at the school, am I allowed to comment or speak about this? And can I vote on it later? That's all okay. Great. Um, yeah, um, I, th I think, um, you know, the, the shelf programme um, does, is going to entail, like, many, many very tangible benefits to the community, and it's a really exciting project. Um, on the site at the moment of the high school, uh, there's substantial uh, hedgerows, and um, whilst a school playing field may not seem like a site that's bursting with biodiversity, um, there are far more invertebrates in, in the soil, in, in the grass, than there will be when we um, lay a lot, a large area of that to um, astroturf and asphalt. Um, so I'm sort of wondering really what we're going to do to firstly, and I, and I do appreciate that we're not in the planning phase at the moment, but what have we got in the back of our minds to, to preserve the current um, habitats that are, that are on the site? And um, are we going to in, enforce a, well, are we going to put a biodiversity net gain of 10% um, to, to try and uh, improve uh, biodiversity on the site? Councillor Richardson, do you want to answer that or do you want to take that on board? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, well, I'll, I'll just start by acknowledging that point and say, as you've referenced, the detail of that would come through the, the planning process once that application is submitted. I suspect we don't have the, the technical detail that you're looking for uh, at, we wouldn't be able to provide it at this meeting. I'm happy to defer to officers if they've got more, uh, more that they can clarify, but otherwise, yes, happy to take that as, uh, as noted. Thank you, Chair. Does somebody want to take that? Please. Um, yes, yeah, so we're working with our public realm team to talk about all of those things. We've got an ecologist working with us and we'll have further information, but we are keeping all the hedgerows on the school site are staying intact, particularly to respond to that bit. We were not move, removing any of those. Thank you very much. Councillor Stringer. Yeah, quick question. Uh, it's about process, really. Uh, the, it says in the recommendation we're going to be submitting a full planning application. Uh, bearing in mind this project is on various different sites, are, are, are we just going to put one planning permission for all the elements, or are we going to split that up? Because I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the hostages to fortune that applying for planning permission can cause. Councillor Richardson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Stringer. Again, I'll have to defer to officers for the, for the, the process of that. Thank you. So, would somebody take that? Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Yes, uh, we will be looking to make one single application across uh, both sites, either the Chiltern Way site and the wider school site. It will be one application, yes. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Councillor Carter. Uh, yes, I, I have a few, I'm afraid. And I know we haven't got it going into planning, but it's, it, this is for outlining the document, but uh, can we confirm at this stage whether or not the access to the drop-off location and parking area of the high school, uh, is it going to be sold for housing, as it's been told before, that it wouldn't be financially viable unless it was done so? Um, 
if it has done so, is the, the bungalow, which is currently used by the security, is that definitely going to be levelled or is that going to be maintained um, as nobody has spoken to the person there yet, uh, the security yard? Um, if it isn't financially viable without the housing case, why aren't we investing more to create a more robust and stable application at this stage? Um, how do you, also, regarding traffic measures for the parents who use that car park, um, how are we going to propose traffic measures for parents to access and drop off their children when they commute? Knowing, as they currently do, whenever that entrance is blocked, they, they park both sides of the road and it causes havoc for buses and the refuse carts or anything else trying to get through. Um, and I also, I'm always mindful not to ask, but regarding the mid suburb Leisure Centre building, which quite frankly is on its last legs, it's in energy inefficient, lacks insulation, correct measures or visibility access. It is a question, it is a question, regards it, given some background to the question. Um, it, it, well, I'll, I'll skip some of this because of the, but, but um, why hasn't it been considered as part of this when it's not fit for purpose when we could be delivering a fit for purpose building and we are idling for correct loads facilities for Stone Market and Mid Suffolk mm -hmm. and the shelf project as it is which would landlock the, the leisure centre um, which would be directly linked to the wellness centre um, by doing this, how would we, in the, in the future, when it would need retrofitting, would need refurbishment, it would need basically rebuilding from the ground up to be providing with access to the thing, how would we do that? <coughs> we would be already quite located, landlocked, with a, with a car facility around it. Would it be possible to actually provide it, or what would happen to a building? Would we end up with a, out, with a wellness hub which we hope will be providing the needs, um, and a then dead build next to it. Whatever stage, what, uh, what happens then? Um, so I think those are, are probably enough questions to start with. There's, there's quite a workload of questions there, and would you... Um, There's more if you want. Yes. <laughs> would, would you like to go through them one, one by one, or do you want to... Councillor Richardson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I've uh, made a note of, of those questions. Uh, thank you, Councillor Carshaw. I'll go through them uh, one by one. Uh, in the first, I think the piece of land you're referring to is the enabling land. Um, that, because it's owned by a school, is subject to an agreement uh, for the disposal, disposal of the land, uh, subject to an agreement with the Department for Education. I will just need to double check with officers whether that agreement has been reached, because I think that will, in some, re in some respects, uh, determine the answer to your question. In terms of um, uh, travel, so we have um, already begun conversations uh, looking at how we're going to manage the travel f uh, and traffic flows from both um, sites, and there will be a detailed travel plan coming forward as part of the full business case to be considered later in the year. Uh, in terms of the leisure centre, why didn't we include that more roundly? I think the, the first thing to mention is that there has been significant funding from Mid Suffolk District Council to Stowe Market Leisure Centre over the last uh, few years, um, particularly for some of their new facilities. Um, in terms of broadening the project to, it conclude, sorry, to include a, a more comprehensive refurbishment, I think primarily that would be, and again, I'm happy to take the um, defer to officers for their professional advice, but I think that would be increasing the scale and the scope of the project to a significant degree that we simply wouldn't have the confidence about delivering it in the round. Um, as you can see in, in the restricted papers, there are already significant sums associated with this um, project, and I think keeping it to a manageable amount, particularly when you look at the uh, other projects that are going on within the district, like the Skills and Innovation Centre, uh, trying to do too much in one go probably would be an area of, of concern for me as a, as, as a portfolio holder. Um, I think there was an additional question about the wellbeing hub, but would you mind just repeating that for me? Because I didn't quite manage to catch that. It was basically regarding the wellbeing hub which was connected to the leisure centre and what would happen if the leisure centre was proved to be um, not serviceable in future. Uh, would it be a, a singular building entity? Uh, what would happen to the external facilities if we lost the leisure centre? Uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, there, uh, some of this work will still 
need to be done once we have a planning application in terms of who would occupy it um, and the service level agreements with whoever would. But I can't see any reason why the Wellbeing Hub couldn't exist as a standalone facility. Obviously, one of the great benefits of it is, is that it's integrated into the, the wider scheme, but there's nothing that would prevent it from being used as a standalone facility. Um, as I say, Chav, I think I've done my best to answer those questions, but happy to defer to officers if there's any more detail that I may have missed. And I've seen uh, officers nodding throughout that, so I think they agree with everything you've said. You haven't said anything that they disagree with. Um, so um, I, I think we're quite happy with that. I'll just go to Councillor Amoroson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just interested, really. Uh, I have questions, but one sort of meta question is, where do I go for more in more information about the two words wellness and education like what um they could include a lot so is there is there any um document that outlines in more detail what those what, what's included in those kind of uh, areas councillor richardson um i think there's either a document or you could tell us what you see those two, wellness and education, meaning? Um, I was going to say, th thank you, Chair. I think that might be entering too much into a philosophical uh, debate. Um, there, there, I don't think there is a, a single document that we have that could point to those two elements, but I'm, I'm sure there'll be plenty of uh, wider reading around the subject, um, but I don't have the details of that to hand. Thank you. Can Councillor Mansell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I note in, um, in the communication document that I think is part of the public area, uh, you've got some milestones um, and you're uh, hoping that there is a planning decision sometime in the summer. It says June in here, but let's not be specific. Things never quite go to plan. Um, and you've said it's going to be one planning application. That's a single planning decision. Um, and clearly you're expecting, you're hoping that the planning decision or the planning will be granted sometime over the summer. Um, what is, uh, how, you know, how long will it take to develop the whole lot? Um, uh, would it be phased? I mean, it's one single planning application, but it's clearly um, a number of sort of units. Um, do you foresee it all happening um, at once, will there be a phased development? Will you be doing one site before the other site? Um, and how long do you think it will be to complete the whole job? Councillor Richardson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mantle. All very good questions. Um, the, at this stage, we're not in a position to provide all of that detail. That would happen once that planning application has been, uh, we hope, approved. But as I said um, in, my, in my introduction, if we approve this today, that does not mean that's then done and dusted and you won't see it again. My expectation would be that when this comes back to the council with a full business case, you would then have that clarity, not just over the funding strategy, not just over the, the operating model itself, but also the timescales for what's being done and if it's going to be phased. Because I, I agree those are all very important questions and we've sort of had tentative preliminary discussions around what that might look like, but we're not in a position to, to lay that out for you in a way that's, um, that certainly would be definitive uh, or that I could therefore be held to account for. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Pratt. Thank you, I'll be brief. Um, so, a resident had emailed me a little while ago. Um, he works with the rugby club on um, Chiltern Fields, and he um, expressed concerns that the council would um, restrict or prevent the rugby club from running uh, the licensed uh, bar and, um, and other clubs that they run um, on the current sites. Um, is, is there any... Um, current intention to, to restrict those activities, or, or is that just, um, is that concern unwarranted? Thank you. Councillor Richardson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I can confirm there's no intention to do that. Uh, and if the resident in question would like to get in touch with us, I'm sure we can, we can reassure them to, to the best of our ability. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, sorry, one more uh, small, small question. Um, I am in touch with a number of um, the dog walkers in Chilton, and um, the, there's been concern raised about the, uh, res any restrictions that might be put on um, using the Chilton fields for uh, dog walking uh, with, the, with the plans. 
Um, so I'd just like to find out positions on that. Councillor Richardson. Thank you very much, Chair. I have to confess that's not something that's been raised to me before, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll hand that one over to officers uh, just to provide some clarity on that. Thank you. Um, so it's not, sorry, it's not our intention to <coughs> put any of the groups using the site currently into any worse position, so we'll be working and continue to work with all of those uh, groups and individuals using the site. Um, there's obviously a fantastic network of, of new uh, footways and paths being created not just on this site but on the wider developments going forward so we would hope that any experience for dog walkers should be enhanced uh, ultimately thank you councillor carter uh, thank you and whilst uh, it, is it this opinion of the council that whilst providing much needed improvements and leisure facilities to uh, to the area which are very much needed and also having spent some money on pet projects like the solar panel like, might not be in the right place and a pretty front to the ledge centre is it adequate to do so to then whitewash across a inadequacy in lack of provision to access to leisure facilities at a heart and central central place whilst maybe only, say, 8% of the population which can't, currently can't access leisure facilities, it's still maintained as about late percent that can't access it, and it's only going to increase the population of less able. So are we saying that by providing additional, we don't need to work more to actually make it up to standard now to provide access to everybody? So we are currently work, uh, provide the shelf, which is wonderful, but overlooking the inadequacy of the leisure centre, which we've spent money on, on the wrong things. How are we going to work that out? Councillor Richardson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would slightly disagree with the assumption that we spent money on the wrong things at the leisure centre. I think that for those of us who went and toured the new facilities when they were uh, finalised, I think they were fantastic. Um, and they've certainly got a whole lot of uh, interest as a result. Uh, in terms of the future of the leisure centre itself, um, I'm happy for us to go away and, and if there are particular areas where you'd like to see improvements, we can look at those. Um, predominantly, that doesn't fall under the uh, economic growth uh, portfolio, so I, I don't have the detail of that to hand, but I'm sure uh, Councillor Flatman and uh, Di Robinson as the Director for Communities and Wellbeing can go away and look at that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And I'll finish the questions now. Um, we only have five minutes, 15 minutes, sorry, um, left before we have to um, extend the meeting. So I'd look for a proposer and a seconder to extend this meeting. Councillor Richardson as the proposer, Councillor Flatman as the seconder. And can I have a show of hands, everyone that agrees that we can extend the meeting? So th that's the majority. So it's carried. Okay, so let's move to debate. Who would like to start debate? Councillor Flatman. left to run before we start looking at a new pool. And you're talking in the range of probably five, six more million, okay? So that's not actually on the table today. I just wanted to make that clear. It still has shelf life, and we can't just get rid of it now because it seems like a good thing to do. Be lovely, really lovely, um, but we can't do that, okay? Um, and the... Um, the matter of um, wellness, well-being, sport and leisure, healthiness. There's so many teenagers today and the whole generation who does need exercise. And with exercise comes a wellness, a well-being. And we're thinking that the well-being hub is going to be well-placed for those teenagers. If anybody has anything to do with teenagers today, you know they are suffering. Okay, lockdown was not good for them. So this is why the wellness hub is going to be situated at the school. We're hoping that other children's services might be offered there from our health partners. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any further people for debate? Um, Councillor Mellon. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, this, uh, we just uh, approving a, a small amount of money at this stage, I think, to, to move this project forward, uh, which is a good thing. I will just raise a couple of points that um, Councillor Wellham would have raised. Uh, he's had to go early, um, but he has raised the point of uh, the, 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 the possibility that the parking on this project will be inadequate uh, as soon as you get a, an, an away team from you know a rugby team turning up they could very soon you know take all, all all the spaces available for parking and related to that is is the the necessity of um, making those uh, walking and cycling connections um, to the site from within stow market i know some of that is not uh, part of this authority's remit it's another authority but there does seem to be um some sort of uh, you know a certain amount of slowness in that regard in terms of getting these things moving because they could be happening now ahead of uh, ahead of our uh, our progress with the um, planning application but i certainly will be voting for this and i'd be glad to see this this really good project move forward thank you chair thank you councillor humphreys mr chair thank you what a fantastic fantastic bit of good news this is um, small amount of money to get this thing moving forward. I can't wait to see it in front of planning. We've been waiting for this for years, not just as Stowe Market, but as a district. For Stowe Market, and I'm a Stowe Market councillor, puts on the map. It's fantastic. Um, so thank you for all the work you've done. Thank you for the proposals. Thank you for the design. Hopefully we'll all vote for this money to push it forward. We can get this thing done. As far as parking goes, parking right now is terrible, and I live close to it. Um, it's definitely inadequate. And I did notice in the plans that there are parking improvements. So even if it's one space more, that's a good improvement. Gets my vote, and I'll definitely vote for this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mayor. Excellent. Um, excellent project. I shall be voting for it. But I would like to wave the flag for the rural areas of our district. Um, I'm a member of Walton Willow Sports Club. Excellent club. Um, it's actually listed in our sport and leisure strategy as um, a very important part of sport and leisure in the wild northwest of our district. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know, and I'm over the moon, that Walsh and Willows are building a gym. Um, that gym has received 25,000 uh, yeah, pounds from the district. Thank you. The other 75% has been raised by the club. What should I say to my members in my ward when they ask me, Stone Market Rugby Club are getting a new pavilion. How much are they contributing to that? Nothing. Stone Market is receiving a lot of funding from this council, fantastic. But please, please do not forget the rural areas. We need to get sporting facilities out into those areas. They are currently funding their own facilities and I don't think they're getting a fair um, rub of the green. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, Councillor Pratt. Yeah I agree that um, parking facilities in the area is currently woefully um, in inadequate and um, we need to improve that and we also as, as Councillor Mellon has said we also need to improve um, walking and cycling links to the centre as well. Um, kind of coming as a teacher, really, as I may, if I may, um, I, th I think, you know, we're, we're covering some really, really important things. Um, we really need to help our, our students and young people in Stone Market to get active, improve their physical health and their mental health and well-being in general. And I think that a lot of the, um, a lot of the facilities here will, will definitely help to improve that. Um, one thing that we might also want to bring into it is nutrition. Um, and encourage um, students and young people um, to eat healthily as part of a sort of well-balanced kind of lifestyle. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if that's really part of the plan, but I think food and nutrition is all really like absolutely central to our physical health and our well-being as well and the way that we feel about ourselves. Um, on the side as well, um, our school has a capacity of about eight, well, not capacity, sorry, current number of students is around 850. That might not be 100% accurate, but it's around that. With a capacity of around 1,200, we have a really woefully inadequate um, 
uh, canteen at the moment, which can probably uh, fit no more than 200 people in there at a time. This means that students are taking their lunches out in plastic containers and styrofoam containers out onto the school fields. Some of them ended up dumped and have to be collected by our site team, so we've got a bit of a problem with littering. It would be really, really nice if some part of this facility could include um, um, like a, a canteen or something slightly off-site or, or some extra facility to, to do that. I mean, I know that's more to do with County Council than it is for us um, and for the Trust, but it's just, some, just a point I want to make, really. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'll call an end to debate, um, and I'll ask Councillor Richardson if he'd like to add anything. Thank you very much, Chair. I will just be brief because I know we are uh, moving up to the, the three-hour mark. Uh, it's just to, to thank members uh, for their contributions. Uh, certainly, the various points uh, raised we can take on board, and as I say, you will get more detail uh, when the full business case comes back to the Council later in the year. Uh, as we say, this is only a, a small amount, relatively small amount of money to progress this project further, and I, and I hope uh, I, that members will, will support it on that basis. Uh, and I will just provide a bit of reassurance to, to uh, Councillor Mayor uh, in response to his comments that this is not a project that's being exclusively funded by the district. A uh, key component to this is funding from other outside bodies, including the national bodies for some of the sports uh, clubs involved. Uh, I won't say more than that without straying into the restricted items, but you will see a breakdown of that. Uh, when we come to the funding strategy later in the year, but I just wanted to give that reassurance that it's not uh, mid suffolk spending huge sums of money uh, without asking for contributions from the relevant partners as well. And on that basis, I'm about to wrap up. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Richardson. And on that note, we'll go to the vote. Um, thank you. Um, I will now ask the Corporate Manager Governance and Civic Office to conduct an electronic vote. Thank you, Chair. That is now showing in blue for you to cast your votes. Councillor Brewster, are you having problems? Would you like to cast your vote? Thank you. Thank you. That's unanimous, so that's carried. So we'll now move on to MC 2239. Joint Capital Investment and Treasury Management Strategies 2023 to 24. And I'd like to invite Councillor Muller to introduce this item and to move the recommendation. Councillor Muller. Apologies, I'll start again. Thank you, Chair. I am pleased to introduce this report, which we discussed at our meeting on the 30th of January. Comments from the meeting were taken on board and have been incorporated into this report. Under the SIPFA Treasury Management Code of Practice and the Prudential Code, both published in 2021, and the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities Investment Guidance, published in 2018, we are required to determine separate capital investment and treasury management strategy statements and prudential indicators annually before the start of each financial year. The strategies and indicators to be approved are in the appendices to the report. The appendices A to J can be found in your papers starting at page 177 and concluding on page 237. The capital strategy shows that capital expenditure planned for 23-24 including carry forwards is 55 million of which 43.2 million will be funded by borrowing limits and boundaries for borrowing are set as part of the prudential indicators 
The strategy shows that projected borrowing will not exceed these limits. The ongoing impact on the UK from the war in Ukraine, together with higher inflation, uncertain government policy and a deteriorating economic outlook, will be major influences on the Council's Treasury management for 23-24. At the time of writing this report, the Authority's Treasury management advisor, Arlene Close, was forecasting that the Bank of England bank rate will rise to 4% in the first quarter and 4.25% in the second quarter of 2023 and to remain at this level until the first quarter of 2024. There has only been one significant change to Treasury limits since last year. The amount that Mid Suffolk and Baber can lend to each other has been increased to 5 million from 2 million to enable a more efficient management of cash flow. Now I'd like to propose the recommendations as set out in 3.1 to 3.7 of the report and would ask for a seconder. And those recommendations are on pages 169 and 170 of your papers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Muller. And I'm happy to be the seconder for that, being on that committee. So we'll, um, we'll move to questions. Are there any questions? Sorry, we'll move. Oh. Question from uh, Councillor Davies. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. It was just a quick one on the subject of ESG. Uh, have we made any progress in uh, defining our ESG score and benchmarking it? Thank you. The Director of Corporate Resources. Thank you, Councillor Davies, for your question. No, I know I did um, answer the Joint Audit and Standards Committee that I would take that away and look at it. I've been a little bit preoccupied with the budget stuff, so apologies, I haven't followed that one up yet, but I certainly will before we bring any more Treasury management reports back to committee. Thank you very much. Any further questions? We'll go to debate. Would anyone like to um, debate? Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I've just got one problem with all this, really, and, and that is that, that three and a half years after we passed our um, climate emergency um, motion, um, we still don't seem to have managed to have got rid of our fossil fuel investments, and um, presumably we, we're still sitting on, on a loss, um, a potential loss which is yet to be crystallised through selling and, and um, selling that the investments that, in, that include the fossil fuels etc and then rebuying them without um, without the um, without including those which is basically f filtering um, ESG environment social and governance issues so um, yeah that is my one problem with all this that really need to have been done by now. And, and whether the, the officers can, can confirm whether we're still sitting on a loss um, which we haven't brought into the accounts yet. Um, but I believe we're going to have to bring them into the, into the accounts fairly soon. So let's get on with it and um, get rid of all the oil and gas and coal from our portfolio. Thank you. So um, there's a statement there. Was there a question? Oh, sorry, I thought we no, no, no. We're in debate, but I didn't know if you asked the. Well, um, I, I, if officers would like to, like to provide any, any um, new information about that, because I wasn't at the last couple of meetings. Thank you, Director Corporate Resources. Yeah, um, I don't have the valuations to hand, Councillor Matheson, but obviously we are about to prepare um, the 22-23 statement of accounts, so we will be updating those valuations so we will be providing an update as part of the outturn for that um, so yeah we'll be bringing further information forward councillor humphreys mr chair thank you um, i'll be supporting this thank you and thank you for a good report david um, on the fossil fuel thing I i've got shares i'm not a massive investor and i'm not sort of in the city or anything like that but my ones in hydrogen and solar power they've rocketed down and actually everything in shell and bp is rocketed up so um, the statement that we're losing money, I think that's to be defined properly. That's just a, a belief, all right? It's not fact, and that's why we'll wait for the report. 
Thank you. Councillor Mayer. I wish to make that point as well. Um, I think Shell and BP have doubled in price over the last couple of years. And let's not forget that um, I know BP is investing £20 million in green energy. And vilifying the fossil fuel um, industry, they produced it, we used it. So we can't point at them and say it's their fault. So we're investing, my hydrogen shares have also gone down. So we're investing to earn money for the people in this um, district. We invest in those things that are going to give us a return. And I, for one, will support the um, oil companies as long as they keep investing in new technology. And they're the ones that are going to drive it. So it's not as clear cut, and we've certainly not money on, lost money over the last three years. Councillor Amorosan. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it, it, it can get a bit contentious, um, but I, I think I think reducing the argument to, you know, whether whether we're losing money or making money does reduce the uh, discussion a little bit. Sorry, it's an investment. That's what investments are. Well, yes, in like. Okay, let's keep it. To okay, the person yeah, speaking. Okay, sorry, just finish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're right, yeah, we, we, we invest in our future and uh, when doing that, it's not just about what's going to um, make more money. Uh, I think it's a nuanced issue, but my view is that these companies uh, represent um, large groups of people who aren't perhaps pointing in the same direction that we need to invest in. Um, you know, there's been various attempts by BP to uh, rebrand, you know, Beyond Petroleum. It was um, kind of, it was, a, it was financial reasons that m made them pull back from that. And, and when you say financial and when you say profit, it's about, it's about confidence. It's about how confident we are to, you know, that yes, shares go up because people get more confident because other people are doing it. So we have to, you know, it's, it's sort of peer group. So I'm just saying there's more to it. And uh, I, hope, I, hope we, uh, I hope we broaden our horizons in terms of what investment actually means. Thank you. Councillor Davies. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the officers for preparing a, a good report, and clearly I'll support that. Um, in terms of the contentious issue we're talking about, um, I think since we have, as a council, decided that we should be carbon neutral by 2030, and I think that's something like only seven years away now, then everything we can do to get there and show our constituents that we're doing the right things in all aspects, including our investments, and things will go up as well as down when you invest. Um, I think that's to be commended. I'd just like to finish with a final observation, and that is the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Thank you. Councillor Epignon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm slightly concerned that um, we should be vilifying companies that make significant contributions to the pension funds of our residents um, when they have been working very hard to, to have pensions that will see them through their retirement in good stead. Um, I would point out to Councillor Matheson that the uh, oil companies are actually, on balance, the largest investors in green energy in the world today. I would also like to point out to him that the drive to use solar energy is predominantly supplied from China, who are building one coal power station pretty much every week or month, 
uh, to fund to, to fuel the industrial expansion. So you know you got to look at this thing in the round, okay? Um, and and the same goes for electric vehicles. Ninety percent of the world's batteries, other than Tesla, come from China. And how is that fueled? It certainly isn't fueled by solar energy. So let's just keep a bit of perspective. The work that we're doing here is, is well thought out. Of course, it can always get better. And we need to make sure that whatever investment we do make does actually earn us money, which we're going to put towards frontline services. So let's not kick the horse that's feeding us, or the mouth that's feeding us, sorry. Councillor Field. Thank you. Yes, we must keep perspective, but I don't know whether you've noticed the sort of charges against Exxon and the way their research people has been uh, hiding information they turned up in the 1970s on the impacts of mm. their activities. Uh, that, that seems to me to be significant. A sort of related point is actually that uh, when you look at CCLA is the one I look at. Some of these investment companies, their ESG related funds do do pretty well. In fact, I think better than the ones that aren't. So it isn't necessarily an enormous um, penalty. As to investing in these companies and making profit, I have to confess I have a few shares in Shell that I haven't got rid of, and yes, they do make a profit. But I guess one could make profits in other ways. Uh, Cadmus Factory would do very well indeed. Most red light districts do pretty brilliantly, but I don't think we would invest in that sort of thing, would we? Or well, at least I'm sure Tim wouldn't like us to invest in that sort of project. So, you know, it's complicated, but we really do desperately need to solve some of these issues and continuing to invest in uh, companies that are going in the wrong direction is not a good thing to be doing. Councillor Pratt, have you spoken in the debate? No. No? Okay, please go now. I've got your name down, but I couldn't remember if you've spoken or not. Yeah, well, um, you know, the, the coal companies didn't um, lead the way in oil and gas exploration, and the railroads didn't lead the way in constructing roads. Um, as far as I know. And, um, you know, in terms of investing in fossil fuel companies, it is really a choice. Um, it is a choice that we are making to do so. Um, I think Councillor Field alluded to the fact that ExxonMobil um, very accurately predicted the impact of, of burning fossil fuels on global temperatures inc with incredible accuracy. But on the other hand, did their worst to muddy the waters on the effect that it was having. Um, so when it comes to vilifying oil companies, I'm afraid it's really not that difficult to do so. Um, my opinion is, is that we could invest in any number of other companies uh, that are developing green technologies um, to lead the way forward. We don't necessarily need to depend <laughs> on those um, you know, oil and gas companies to do this job for us. Thank you very much. And we, we seem to be looking at this in a, um, from a certain position. I think it's only fair for the people at home, as someone on that audit committee, that um, the fossil fuel side of this is a single figure percentage of one of the three funds that we have. So um, I, just, I just want us to not get too to, I don't want to give the message to people at home that this is all within fossil fuels. It's a, it's a small amount, but I'll take Councillor Stringer's. Um, yeah, sorry now. to continue the fossil fuel shareholder meeting, uh, but uh, it certainly sounded like it from this side of it. Uh, I don't have any shares in fossil fuel companies at all, and I'm, I'm, I'm rather proud that I don't. Uh, that's my personal uh, decision. Uh, I do have a thing, it, it is slightly laughable to suggest that fossil fuel industries are going to lead the way in, in getting to the cleaner fuels that we must provide uh, within the next decade. 
The, the opera to suggest that £22 million of investment from BP out of £157.7 billion operating uh, billion from, from, from this one year is, is frankly not good enough. They should be, there should be more. Uh, so not investing in them would then give that clear signal that they're not moving fast enough because they're not. We need and we have to meet those zero emission targets. It's not a, but to suggest that, uh, you know, th that the fossil fuel companies will, will bail us out, all of the history is telling us, no, they won't. They will move at the slowest rate they can move to guarantee their profits for their shareholders, which is their first duty in law. Why would they not uphold their first duty in law? And the first duty in law for us, us as a councillor, should be to protect our residents. And it's quite interesting that some councillors are saying they're getting really good returns on their shares from their fossil fuel companies. Yes, we're all getting those returns. We're breathing them. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Um, on that note, I will um, close the debate. Um, um, Councillor Muller, would you like to add anything at this point? Uh, nothing to add, thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll ask the Corporate Manager, Governance and Civic Office to conduct the electronic vote. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That is now starting and in progress for you to cast your vote. <laughs> I'll um, uh, vote verbally for this one. Um, I went onto the audit paper to <laughs> on the thing, so I'm, I'm for this. Thank you. Thank you. So, Chair, that is um, 24, seven against, and one abstention. So that's carried. Thank you. So now we'll. Go on to councillor appointments. Are there any changes to placings? No. Um, and motions on notice? There are none. So um, I'd just like you to um, make a note that um, the next meeting is the 20th of March um, at 5.30, but we will be having a um, group photo for this um, term at 5 p.m. So if you could get here nice and early for that group photo and I'll um, finish the meeting at 8.44.